started having issues within my own group of people, meaning like management, we started having issues <clears throat> and things just got to a point where I literally wasn't having fun anymore. Um, Cause then the label got out of black music. They're like, Oh, guess what guys? No more black music department. Wow. And I oh. went, you do know you have people here that do R and B, right? Like I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just wondering it's just... <laughs> if you remember there's a lot of black music here. <laughs> um, yeah. Then you're a teenage girl and you're just like, I don't, you know, here comes another president. Here comes new staff, new ideas. And I, um, oh, and then there's problems with management. Um, I'm growing up, so I'm going through all these different physical changes, mental changes, emotional changes as a young woman. It's, it was a lot at, all at once that I shut down. And when I shut, say shut down, I spiraled in, into a depression. And as I said, we've got a special guest today, and um, Miss Tracy Spencer. I'm so excited that she has um, reappear, uh, come up reappeared after so many years. So it's going to be great talking to Tracy about her career, about her music, about her journey, and uh, what she's been up to because she's doing some tours and stuff. So look forward to talking to Tracy and uh, on halftime chat. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can see and I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> How are you doing? Sure. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. <laughs> it's uh, good. Re re really good to be able to see you and talk to you. <laughs> yeah, finally. We finally figured it out. <laughs> yes. You know, there's there's a picture of yourself, Shana, Elle, and Shanice that you guys took in LA a couple, just before Christmas. Or yeah. Yeah. So I'd, I'd said to myself, well, I, Sh uh, Sh uh, Shana was my first guest back in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, then it was <clears throat> Shanice. Then I interviewed Elle. And I said, I need to finish this picture and get all four of you. So you. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I, <laughs> you, um, I knew you interviewed Shauna and Shanice. I didn't know you had interviewed Elle, though. So that that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but um, before we start, I really want to congratulate you, you know, Dean's List for the fall. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself because I have, it, it was a tough decision for me to make because it's kind of like I've been on this journey of, I don't know, I like to learn, right? That's kind of my thing. I like learning new things. I think that's what you should do when um while you're here we don't know all the answers to everything yeah. um i have other personal interests uh i even you know i have a bachelor's in psychology because um i was trying to help a family member who was going through a very difficult time and or not necessarily just help them but to better understand their journey and then that could maybe better help um, help them if, you know, if they needed me um, and just have a better understanding as to why people do what they do. And, uh, you know, cause we all have our struggles and things like that. So for me, ever since I was a kid, I was like, Oh, I want to be, you know, in the, in the medical field. And I also want to be a singer. Those are like the two <laughs> things that I really want to do. And then my mom was like, I don't know how you're going to do both, but I'm sure you can figure it out yeah. um, because mom was a nurse. Okay. And <clears throat> so it just was one of those things that before she passed in 2021, she kept saying, you know, you should really finish um, that other dream of yours and um, just to do it for yourself. She's like, whether you use it or not, at least you can say, Hey, I, I, I won't have any regrets and, and I'll do it. And it, but that was a very, tough decision to come to because after 
you know, I lost my dad. It'll be 10, 10 years ago this month. Uh-huh. And losing my mom, who was literally my best friend, um, it was, I felt like I couldn't do it. Uh-huh. Like I needed them here to kind of Motivation. be my support. Yeah. But I think they've been guiding me through all of this for sure. I mean, how hard was it? I mean, um, because I, I've i completed my third postgraduate degree in seven years, and I retrained to be a therapist. Um, so I finished my third postgraduate um, uh, in August. And to go back to higher institution after doing finishing my bachelor's degree back in 97 was hard because, mm-hmm. you know, got a family and working and all of a sudden I had to learn. Like it was they and, and I got diagnosed with dyslexia while doing my postgraduate. And it's like, oh, so now that's why I struggled. How hard oh. was it for you to go back into school? Because I, I know it was hard for me just to be in a classroom submitting assignments, being critiqued for my work and having to be disciplined. So what was it like for you then? Extremely hard. I am that I think that's why I posted on my on my IG about fear is kind of what pushes me, you know, and people say you should be fearless and have no fear of things. I, for me, I think it's okay to have fear or be afraid of the unknown because I think that's um, what kind of motivates and pushes people. You know what I mean? To, uh, it, I think we should challenge ourselves. Um, it was definitely the fear of the unknown because I hadn't been, I mean, even when I was recording as a teenager, I wasn't in school that much because I was always on the road. So I had tutors and when I would show up, it was like, oh, there's the girl that's hardly ever here. (laughs) (laughs) How are you? (laughs) And that was a challenge in itself because Um, I was into sports and everything and I had to give up most of that. So yeah, as we get older and you go back to school, it was definitely a challenge. I was completely scared out of my mind that even literally the first week I was like, I I just don't think I can do this. I don't know if I want to do it. And, you know, is it too late to pull out now? And, you know, thank God for my family. Everybody was like, don't do that. Like, just, it's going to be fine. We're all going to be here to support you and you can do this. And I mean, I still cry at least once a week. I'm <laughs> crying. I'm going, God, what am I doing? This is so hard. And then I'm like, okay, it's going to be fine. Because you realize everyone's crying. <laughs> so yeah. 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 You know? But what is it you're studying so people can know that? I mean, because it's it, it it is like what being an uh, an operating supporting in, in an operating theater or something or no. So originally it started off as full fledged on nursing, right? That's okay. kind of what I was going to do, and then the more I learned about how much nurses actually do and this is no disrespect to nursing or nurses because my mom uh, was in that field and worked in the emergency room Mm -hmm. for me um i felt like it i wanted to do something that was more hands-on and uh so i started thinking about physician's assistant and medical assisting. So I went the path of medical assisting and I'm going to continue towards my PA um, because with medical assisting, you do tend to get to work more with uh, closer with, uh, with physicians. And I also have the opportunity to work in uh, with specialists. So I'm kind of leaning towards oncology Okay. right now or car or, or cardiology um are two of my interests and the fact that we get to assist in minor surgeries and you also get to do phlebotomy and it's kind of like hands-on training so I get to learn a whole lot even um once I get started so I'm kind of excited about that path wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean as I said it's it is 
especially for any of us who, as I said, if you've been out of school for a long time and then trying to get back in and doing something quite different because you didn't do that for undergrad. So it's it's a lot more learning, isn't it? It is a lot more learning. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely stressful. I don't sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> wow. How long do you have before you, you think you might finish? Um, I'll do my externship uh, starting in June. And then I'll take the boards. And then um, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. Okay. <laughs> at least with that. Because for my PA, there's schools that I want to go to in California. I don't think I'm going to, um, or that I'm interested in. I don't, uh, so I'm going to, I've been exploring that to see exactly where I want to go, but most likely it'll be on the West Coast to finish the program. Okay. But yeah. Well, I mean, definitely wish you luck with that because I say, I know it's not easy, but it's, it's, and I think for those who are going to watch, they're going to be like, wow. So, she, you know, after a one career, you can actually, take time and then go back in. And if she could do it, goodness, why am I procrastinating? So it's a really good to be able to see and hear that, um, <laughs> you know, they, it's hard, but it's rewarding as well. It's very rewarding. And yeah, nothing, nothing's easy. And I, and I was, a, to me, I think even in high school and stuff, I wasn't the best student. And I think it was because um, I traveled so much. Mm. It's not that I didn't, um, want to do well. I worked hard, but I wasn't as focused because yeah, I was crazy. making, yeah, I had a whole nother, a whole career. Um, so going back, yeah, that was part of the challenge too. I was like, maybe I'm just not cut out for school. Maybe this is not something I'm really like good at. And, you know, I'm not going to do well. And so no, I've, I'm glad I, I made the choice to go back because I think I would have ended up going, why didn't I go back and, you know, what would have happened if I went back and, um, you know, we're, we're here for such a short amount of time. I'm going to try and challenge myself and do as much as I can um, while I'm here. Yeah. But you did your psychology. Did you ever think about going the therapist route? I did. And then I realized I needed a therapist. So, <laughs> I was like, uh, I think I'm a good patient <laughs> for someone. I don't know if I should be telling others what to do. No, that was, re that was part of it. Once I started the journey, I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. And then um, I learned a lot about addiction. I learned a lot about, you know, uh, behavioral therapy and I kept thinking maybe this is where what I really want to do and then I just and then I realized it really it really wasn't um, I learned a lot and I definitely carry it with me all the time and I think it's also helped me with going back to school right now because you kind of can apply that stuff to the medical field obviously dealing you know with patient care so yeah. Um, it wasn't a waste. I I actually have, you know, um, once I finished, I was able to support that person that was struggling and, mm -hmm. and have been helpful to other friends of mine that had either dealt with addiction or um, just stuff in their life. So I, it was meant for me to go. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, I studied, I, I went to college in Wisconsin and I and I studied finance and man, marketing, but um, retrained as a cognitive behavior therapist for kids. Uh, so wow. that was, and so, uh, so yeah, when, when, and, and actually part of why I, I do this is because I, I recognized the health inequality of black mental health, uh, mental health among black, our black community. And so being able to have guests talk about their ups and downs and successes helps the people watching to think, actually, we, we, you know, as, you know, if they can get help and if they can admit challenges, you know, it's why, what about us? So it's in a way trying to really promote the fact that as, as people of color, um, 
going to church is good, but it's not the only thing. And there, there are some of us that, you know, there are other outlets to get that that type of support and talk, talking to friends, talking to professional, but um, making sure that it, it's not a white thing. It is actually a helpful thing to be able to to talk about weaknesses and struggles and then and being able to celebrate when you overcome. So, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we started backwards because I always start off because I've got an international audience. And so people would want to, when they tune in, they're like, oh, where's everyone from? So, I, you know, where, where were you sort of born and raised? So it gives people an idea. I was born and raised in Waterloo, Iowa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which most people, even to this day, still go how did you get in Iowa? Like, how did that even happen? And like, it's some foreign uh, <laughs> place and it's not, it's, it's the Midwest where, I mean, I'm four hours away from Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like, you're just in the middle of everything. It's extremely beautiful here. It's quiet, very peaceful, which is great for my brain. <laughs> great for my sanity so no I love it and my parents my dad's background he's um French Canadian and black and so French his Canadian wow French Canadian and black and his family came uh from Canada wow so like my grandmother um came from there my mom she's Creole and was born and raised in Louisiana and grew up in a household where they only spoke um French and all her siblings obviously went to school to learn English but yeah her parents my grandparents never spoke any English and um my dad ended up being you know being raised in another small town in Iowa called Marshalltown which is about I don't know like an hour and a half away from Waterloo and um I mean, it's like a movie the way him and my mom met because my mom lost her uh, lost her mom when she was 15. She had a heart attack. Wow. And she was uh, the second youngest out of, I got to think, I think it was nine siblings, nine wow. or 10 siblings. Wow. Wow. And so they all kind of, you know, stepped in and were raising each other and, um, as they got older, everyone started to kind of leave and try to find another, you know, their own path. And my mom had this dream of going into the Air Force. Wow. And one of her siblings was out here in Iowa. And she was traveling to come visit him. So to make a long story short, my dad was a musician and he had a band called the Cavaliers and they traveled all through the Midwest. Um, he was the lead singer and they would do uh, like James Brown, Jackie Wilson, songs like that. And from those artists and he even opened shows for like Jackie Wilson and little Richard what? when he wow. was younger. Yeah. My dad was, he started sneaking into clubs when he was 14 <laughs> and singing yeah, that was just his thing. He just knew he wanted to be a musician. And so my mom ends up in this uh, restaurant bar type vibe in the Midwest and uh, with her brother and his, um, I think it was his wife at the time or fiance. My dad was performing there and he walks up to my mom after he gets done singing and he just said, um, you know, introduced himself and he said, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> and my mom was like, you're crazy. <laughs> and he was like, maybe, but I'm going to marry you. So he literally low key stalked her for <laughs> several days. Like you couldn't do that today. <laughs> like, <laughs> you would literally like, yeah, be considered crazy doing stuff like that now. But he um, pursued her for like a week while she was in town. And um, I mean, 
she ended up going on a date with him. Um, she never went to the Air Force, never went back to Louisiana. And like six months later, they were married and wow. they were married for almost 50 years. Wow. The wildest story in the world. <laughs> oh, goodness. I love it. Did they make, both speak French? Um, my dad, no. Mom oh. held on to the language and um, would speak it occasionally in the house. And my sister and I, were we were the only ones that tried to study it and pick up on it. And then now I'm horrible at it. And it's sad. <laughs> no, because you say your dad was French Canadian. So I'd assume they both were like, uh, bonjour. My sister. No, he was not speaking. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, thought, <laughs> I thought he used his French to woo your mom like oh look man I know no. French <laughs> yeah I don't think my dad knew any French <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, is that why because I used to I thought people used to say you're from Canada and maybe that's why they connect you know because your dad was Canadian they because I just assumed you were Canadian <clears throat> Oh yeah, no, that I've been so many things and <laughs> or people have put me in places that I've never been. But yeah, no, my background is it's it's pretty pretty diverse because even on my mom's side there's some Spanish and mm -hmm. um uh her uh I wanna say her dad's mom was Native American. Wow. So yeah, it's 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 pretty cool just to see how um how diverse my my background is and it's like over time we uh started asking more questions because that was the one thing as a kid growing up in Iowa there weren't many people that looked like my family in the beginning like when I was a kid now yeah <laughs> see a lot of people that look like me here but but in the beginning it really wasn't like that so I we all kind of started questioning like more about our background and yeah came from as a kid you don't really think about it as much but as we started to get older I started questioning and you start realizing goodness like it's pretty interesting um just how diverse your background really is like all these different parts of you yeah i mean especially now a lot of a lot of people are doing the ancestry and just checking what the heritage and the makeups are did, did you ever yeah. do any of that dna test no. to since my mom has passed we've talked about doing that so that's probably something i will be doing this year too just because i i am super curious to find out <laughs> yeah i mean it's a good thing i mean yeah my parents are nigerians and and they were mm. born and raised in Nigeria. So I know, you know, I've gone to the village and I know my great grandfather. I know even know where the tribe immigrated from, you know, so it, wow. it's nothing much there. Um, but I guess it's it's good. A, a lot of American, black African Americans have been also doing that to say, okay, where will we trace from and which, you know, our, our lineage and heritage? Because um, I think. As a therapist who works with kids, identity is really a massive thing. If you if you have a, a sense of identity, it's a real massive um, anchor to support you through a, a world that everyone is trying to get you to fit in somewhere. So I can understand why yeah. people would like to have a sense of identity. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it's super important to know where um, where you come from. It's just, you know, it's a part of who you are. I like to know all those parts. Yeah. How was it like growing up with a yeah. dad who could, who was a, a singer? I mean, I don't know. Was he was singing at home and then talking about, his, I've just been opened up for Little Richard and stuff or? or... Um, yes. My dad, my dad's personality was massive. <laughs> um, complete opposite. I would say of me because I'm definitely, I mean, people laugh when I say this, but I think I'm, I am more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. It's like when I need to be on or need to be out and about. And I think when I'm performing, that's when you see the other side, that other persona. But 
for the most part, I'm a homebody. I <laughs> like to open up a book and read it, watch movies, um, be just be in my house. It is so hard to get me out the house. <laughs> Once I'm out, it's great. But no, I like to be in the house. Um, but yeah, my dad, I mean, at any given moment, he would start singing. Wow. And I mean, his voice was like, magical that we would just be like, Oh, dad, sing that song. again!" Wow. <laughs> you know, we loved hearing him sing. And um, then of course, we would all try to sing along with him and he would teach us songs and got us a piano. And um, my brother, uh, Dino, who um, co wrote a bunch of songs with me, he pretty much self taught himself how to um, play the piano. Um, and he would spend hours on that every day after school. But yeah, I know my dad at any given moment, he had no um, qualms about singing. Like, yeah, he would sing all day if he wanted to. He loved to sing all the time. Did you pick it, pick up singing from, from your dad or was, or was your gift just natural? Um, if my dad tell, were to tell it, he would say it was natural because he said right away when he started to hear me sing around the house, he was like, yeah, she can sing. She's going to be a singer. And he also had a bar that he was running here in Waterloo and he would bring home all of these vinyl records. So like Tina Marie, Diana Ross, who I'm obsessed with, <laughs> Stevie Wonder, like everybody, he would bring these records home and I would go in the basement and I would play them and I would try to memorize every lyric, every inflection, uh -huh. every run, everything that like Tina Marie or Diana Ross would do. I would do that for hours. And it's so nice being in a family who enjoys music because mm -hmm. if they did not I would have driven my parents crazy like <laughs> everyone, everyone in loves music and so my mom would let me to be down in the basement for hours um is either playing Barbies or um singing with Diner Ross like that's all I would do oh and I, and I guess that's it I mean but was there part of your dad to teach you then because I don't know I don't play instruments and stuff so I don't know as a parent then does he think oh, okay let me help you and play with you and nurture the voice he did when he realized it was something that I really wanted to do um the more time I spent like he never forced us to do anything he wasn't that type of parent either one of my parents were like that like you know, go down there and practice and, you know, critiquing us. It was like organic. Mm. It was like, see where it goes. Um, for my mom, she just liked us to be involved in things. So we were all in gymnastics, played basketball. I was in ballet, which was hilarious. <laughs> and track, like she, they kept us busy but my go-to was always singing. So after a while, my dad was like, um, he would sit in the basement with me and then go over certain notes. Or if I was struggling with a note or a run, he would teach me how to push that note out. And um, then he started having, or like telling people in the, in the community, like, oh, I have this daughter. You want her to come sing at your church? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what are you doing? I don't want to sing at people's churches. And I ended up doing like weddings when I was eight, nine years old. Wow. <laughs> it was hilarious. Um, yeah, he was just all of a sudden like promoting me through the town of saying, hey, I have this daughter. You guys got to hear her sing. And then I would be like, OK. And I would just sing for people. Um, but yeah, it'd be church functions, someone having a little party or a gathering. and. <laughs> show up and sing and yeah <laughs> would you get paid it was, for it or was, was it just a freebie or i wasn't getting paid no okay it was free. 
Uh, but was it, it more so for him to try and get you to be confident singing and in, in in front of others, or what was the 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 motive behind that? I think I think it was more. He was just really proud. My dad was mm. that parent that was so proud of his kids yeah. that if we excelled at something or had some type of talent, he would just like to. He wanted everyone to know how proud he was okay. of his. Kids. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It was very sweet, very cute. Um, but we didn't, it's not like we knew that was preparing me to get on Star Search or mm -hmm. even Record Deal. Those were dreams, but being a girl from Iowa and being a, a, a girl of color from Iowa, yeah, I was thinking, you know, I would be like, yeah, I'm going to do this and that. And then I was just like, girl, you are in Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> going nowhere right now. So, <laughs> so for those who, who are watching from around the world, you, you, you know, everyone is thinking, well, either you're in New York or in LA, the Midwest pretty much, the, you know, we, now we talk about people talk about Atlanta, but back in the day, you know, it was pretty much New York, LA. So being in the Midwest, you know, it's, it's pretty much yeah, far from anything. So I, I can imagine how far that dream might yeah. seem, you know, like Dorothy in Kansas, it just seems so far away from, from everything. Absolutely. I felt like Dorothy in Kansas. I was <laughs> like, unless a tornado hits, I ain't getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's not going to happen. What instrument did your dad play? Um, he could play the drums, but he was all about being a vocalist. That was oh, so it wasn't like he played the keyboard or guitar and you'd sing. With no, him. he was the he was the lead singer of his band, and yeah, that was that was his thing. Did yeah. you ever sing with the band? Did I? Yeah, with his Did band. Ever... No. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, um, because. When he started doing, when he was doing that, I wasn't even born. Um, and by the time I was born, it was very late in the game. I was the very last one to show up. <laughs> and they're like, oh, there's another one. Like, great. <laughs> I mean, my mom kept saying she wanted four kids. Okay. But my other siblings are closer in age. And then... Um, it, she was be she was hopeful that she was going to get her fourth and she did oh. but by the time um i was born it was becoming harder for my dad to just be on the road because my mom was working in a hospital and a uh, raising three kids mm -hmm. um so he started doing that less and less um and then tried to work regular jobs. And uh -huh. that's very tough for musicians because mm -hmm. that's been his, you know, his whole life was surrounded by music. So that's when him and my mom kind of talked about, hey, what if, when I get into the bar business, then I can have still be a part of that life and have people come down and perform and be in that environment. Because my dad's just very, he's a social butterfly. <laughs> he, he's got to be like, you know, he's that guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that worked out for him. He loved doing that. And so, yeah, he would, I would go down to the bar though. And as a little girl and help him clean it. And then I would sing around the bar when there was nobody there, obviously. Um, and I loved it. I loved that my dad had a bar yeah. and that there were records and I love the smell of a bar <laughs> I, the energy of it I was just like this is awesome it was pretty cool but then I mean with all that going on did you did was there anyone who had made it um, you know other than Michael Jackson that you could look up to and says well they've made it I've got somebody to to sort of, you know, as a as a sense of, well, if she could have made it, I could make it. Was there anyone that you know, like yourself, that's not in the music industry as a as a child, as a, that you could look to as inspiration? Um, funny enough, there weren't really 
a lot of, you know, outside of Michael Jackson, who started really young that I obviously admired and looked up to. For me, I was very much into old Hollywood stuff. So pictures I would look at or people that I would emulate at home and movies I would watch were everything from Marilyn Monroe to um, Josephine Baker. Uh. Um, I was was inspired by those type of women because they not not just the physical beauty of them, but all the obstacles that they had to overcome. Mm. And they were such strong women. And I was just like, I'm going to be like, you know, Josephine Baker. I'm going to be like these women. I loved Billie Holiday and um, Diane Ross. Yeah. Like I said, I was obsessed with her that when I would come home from school, I would take my hair out of braids and I would be in the mirror. And the bigger my hair was, I was like, this is, <laughs> I want to be like her. And I would have my, and my dad had bought me a microphone and I would be down there and like my mom's, you know, like an, it could be an oversized black shirt and I would make it into a dress and I was like singing Diana Ross. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, absolutely obsessed with, with those women. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to be like them. You know, for those of us who, um, cause I, I think when Star Switch came out, I was probably in, in Nigeria or, or still back in England. And I guess it's equivalent to today's say, American Idol or X Factor or America's Got Talent. Um, how yeah. big was it back in the day, you know, for those of us who probably had, don't know about Star Search, back in when you, before you auditioned, was it, was it massive or was it just for kids or what was it? Star Search was, yeah, exactly like what X Factor and those programs are today for everyone. It was, that was all we had. It was that type of um <clears throat> show where people showcased everything. I mean, they didn't just do music. You had, I remember at one point they had like an acting portion on there. Then they had the <laughs> folks model. They had comedians. Like, yeah, people were obsessed with Star Search. And I just remember um, we would watch it as a family. Mm -hmm. And obviously even then I didn't know how possible it was for me to get on that show. And at that point, my dad had all these different relationships with so many different people in, in the community that one guy, um, this guy named Jeff Isaacs, who bless his heart, uh, he recently, well, he passed um, a few years ago, um, but he had a studio in his home and so my dad started bringing my brother Dino and myself over there and we would like write songs. He would help us lay these tracks and I would just start recording things. Wow. Still not with the intention of we had a real plan. <laughs> my like, we're going to take these demos. We're going to a record label. And <laughs> blah, like, it wasn't even like that. It was for me, it was um it was just fun like i had so much fun doing it, it was i would do it after school cuz my mom was just like uh it, when she's done with other activities yes you can go play at the studio <laughs> you can record songs whatever and <laughs> my dad would sit there and you know coach me through it and we took it very seriously but it was a lot of fun and then it got to a point where I had a few songs and we're still watching Star Search and my dad's like, you're going to get on Star Search. And wow. we're like, yeah. I was like, damn, that is like dream the impossible dream. There's <laughs> Star Search. And the next thing I know, my dad's like runs into this um, guy who was my first manager from Kansas City. Um, he actually ran into my dad or hearing him perform somewhere in a club somewhere and was interested in him okay. as a musician. And this guy, uh, my first manager, Stan, he um, actually had managed the Ozark uh, Mountain Daredevils. 
Um, so like these seventies groups okay. were huge and Steely Dan, like he wow. was involved in their careers. And then he also had like this coffee house and Steve Martin in the beginning of his career used to go there and do stand up. Okay. So he was well connected, but when he met my dad, he was like, Oh my gosh, your voice is amazing. Like, you need to be recording. My dad said, nope, but I have, I know someone that you, you would be interested in. He's like, I don't think it's for me anymore, but I know, but you know, I, I have someone that I'd like you to meet. And he's like, who? He's like, well, it's one of my kids. And he's like, oh, so she's like 20, 25 years <laughs> old. My dad's like, she's 10. <laughs> like, excuse me? Yeah, she's 10. <laughs> He's like, what am I supposed to do with a 10 year old? <laughs> and my dad's like, you listen to her voice, you'll understand. And he played him the demo. And then he was like, very impressed. And he was like, okay, well, let me at least meet her and <laughs> let's let me figure this out. And so he met me. And then we all talked about, you know, he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, oh, I want to be on Star Search. Like, let's let's start there. If, if that's if you can make that happen, let's do. Star <laughs> and yeah, we sent in my demo. I even created a video that I um, started calling like. The local libraries to um, see if I could utilize their facilities to shoot like a video with friends and okay. some family and it became this so we were it just became this whole thing where we were then trying to find songs which is now it's easy to do that you can find a, a whole lot of karaoke style songs okay on the internet and sing to I was limited. There was Missing You by Dinah Ross. It had to be a Dinah Ross. Okay. <laughs> I found an instrumental to that. And then Do Me Baby, Melissa Morgan, the Prince song. Mm. Um, and How Will I Know? Because at that point I was falling in love with Whitney Houston. Wait, wait, wait. So, <clears throat> so I performed those three songs in the basement of a library. Oh. And I sent that video into Star Search. And that's how I got on star search. Cause then they sent me a letter back and they were like, we'd like to have you on our show. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, there's no way I'm about to get on a plane and go to Cal <laughs> like go to Hollywood and be on star search. Like what? That was a lot. <laughs> wow. I mean, what, what was it? Like? I mean, getting the letter though, did I mean, was it, did you think that's it? Dreams over. I've got the dream I wanted. Or was it a big celebration? <laughs> I don't. I didn't even know. It was. It was very overwhelming. They, mm. it, it felt like, you know, you still feel like you're in a dream. Yeah. You know, it's it's just hard to believe because you're still going. Oh my god! Like really, they actually opened what? up <laughs> my package and they watched my video. Like what? So it was, it was, it was very hard to, to wrap my little brain around that and my family. No one could believe that was happening. So. Wow. Did, it you, was did you become an instant star locally once they see you on TV? Um, it felt, well, my, my dad had a lot to do with that because he was, he would always do too much. He, <laughs> too much. <laughs> too much he obviously with him having a bar and being you know the social butterfly he was that he was always telling everybody like you know my daughter's gonna be on star search and we're going to california and all this stuff and we went out there we even got to, it was my first time going to disneyland like we oh. planned this whole trip and it was it was crazy um so yeah no it after it came on, we, you know, went to the local newspaper, talked to the local news station, and they ended up putting it on the news, like, you know, wow. local girl 
gets on star search and so everyone in the community started hearing about it so that they could watch it and it, was, it felt like everyone watched it because every wow. time I went somewhere they're like we saw you on star search and <laughs> you know it was uh, like good luck because I was the nice thing is I was on towards the end of the season okay so I didn't have to start at the beginning and try to beat out oh, a yeah. whole, whole lot of people I was at the very tail end so it was really competing against um, Allison Porter, um, who was in Curly Sue, the actress. And okay. we were, yeah, we were both at the end of the season. And then when we kept tying, we had to uh, go um, challenge a third contestant. And then that's how I ended up winning because then I um, essentially beat both of them out and won. So, yeah, it was nerve wracking though. <laughs> How was it like, like the um, the Ed McMahon? Or was it? it was Ed McMahon. Yeah. What was it like? I mean, he's he's on TV. He's a legend. Sort of his, and I see he seemed very warm to to the to the contestants, especially kids. But what was it like seeing him, the legend as he was back? Oh, it was wild. It's like. Um... He was the sweetest person in the world. He was so kind. He's like a gentle giant because he was as tall as my dad. And um, yeah, just the nicest man. I was so excited to meet him. And even in my parents' home, my uh, mom blew up this massive <laughs> photograph of me and McMahon and my dad from Star Search. Wow. And, yeah. It was very cool. So, so yeah. you're winning a, 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 co a national competition like that. Do, 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 as a family, you think, that's it. We've made it, you know, Hollywood. Or what, what goes for you when, when you win? What what happens? Do phones ring? Or... That's really what happened. Um, you know, you come back and, you're, and I'm thinking, oh, um, I'm going to go back to school and just be – a normal kid and literally after it aired and I won um I started getting all kinds of phone calls and they were all from record labels wow so yeah it was everything from CBS records at the time and then it was Capitol um I'm trying to think Columbia records um yeah it was like several different record companies they were all calling and then they were saying hey we'd like you know to fly you out and audition for the labels and once again as ex you know when i when i sit here now and i think about that it is pretty it's pretty wild because things are done so differently now <laughs> that i think it it was a lot scarier then because it, it, to get a deal it was based on so many different parameters, like to get an actual record deal. It was, you had to do like jump through hoops to get <laughs> a record deal. And at that age, even, um, I mean, at that point I was 11 years old labels were interested but at the same time they were like well, what are we going to do with an 11 year old like that was always the thing what do, how do you market yeah. an 11 year old female without making her hypersexualized or um trying to like develop the artist mm -hmm. so that you know she continues to grow with her audience and people watch the evolution of this artist mm -hmm. that was part of the challenge um, so when I went, you know, to Capitol and I went to studio a, which is like, you know, the studio where the Beatles performed mm. Billy holiday sang in that studio. And so I literally thought I was going to pass out when I walked <laughs> in there. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is my life right now. Couldn't imagine. I was just like, this, this can't be happening. And I sang in the studio in front of these executives and they were just like, you know, super impressed. And so then it became the, the, uh, 
battle of who's going to get this young girl, who is she going to sign to and who's going to have the better deal. And um, at that point, uh, for me, it was, I didn't really know who I was or what type of artist I wanted to be. Mm. I knew who inspired me, but I also knew I couldn't go around and um, be Diana Ross at 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that would have read well or how that would have came off, how people would have perceived that. So it was, it was tough. It was, it, it was definitely tough in the beginning trying to figure out how, where do I fit in and how do we do this? And, and at that time I, I'd heard of Shanice being signed uh, mm -hmm. to her label as well. And they were holding on to her because they weren't sure how to, I think, market her in the beginning too. It was just like, what do you do with these young girls? Oh. You know, it's different now, but yeah, at that time it was just, it was, you know, the labels were run by so many men. Everyone yeah. I was surrounded by were mostly men. I, I didn't encounter too many women in the beginning um, when I was signed. So yeah, you have all these men trying to make decisions for a child. Yeah. And like, I don't know what I would, <laughs> right? I just want to, you know, like, sing. <laughs> like, yeah. You know. Whose idea was it to sign with Capital? Because you had your manager, you had your dad. I mean, wh why did they choose Capital? Uh, why did they accept Capital? Capital was the most persistent. Okay. And for me, it was the history. I just kept thinking about all of the, you know, the rich history of Capitol Records and all the talent that had walked through those doors. And I wanted my name to be a part of that. Wow. So you think of the Beatles or you think of Billie Holiday, then it's like, and then there's Tracy Spencer. Like, I was like, if I can be in that, that group, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. And they did have, they, you know, worked really hard in creating um, a really great or like bringing a really great offer to the table because I in the beginning you know yeah they really really believed in me and they were like we're really going to try and see if we can make this happen we, we want to do this so yeah I, I, mean, I think one of the questions I think one of the things that I, I, I had learned a lot from a lot of artists from the 90s was the signing without knowing the fine print of the business side um being that Capital were very persistent with signing you and you had a manager and your, and your dad around, were you guys giving um, a better business deal or did, um, you know, were they just said sign here and you just like, you know, 10 years later, like, oh, what did we just sign? How was it at that stage? Um, thankfully, no, that I didn't look back and go, oh my God, I'm I, like, they totally screwed me. <laughs> no, I did right away get a really good attorney to to come in. Um, I said, you or your parent? I mean, because you're, you're just 11, so I'm just wondering what you said I did, I got. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> that, that would be my parents doing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they we would have these discussions because obviously I didn't know, <laughs> but they also were, they would never do anything or have these discussions without including me because they okay. wanted me to know and learn, that yeah. part of it. And to, yeah, exactly. And to learn about the business side of the music business, obviously at 11, part of that, you know, I wasn't that interested in the business. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, let's just sign something. Let's <laughs> do this. But my dad was like, no, it's just, it's not that that simple so yeah no um i do remember that it, it, uh, there was a lot of negotiating going back and forth for a while it was okay. not a one and done deal um always leaving an option for me to to get out if okay. uh you know for whatever reasons like not to feel for me to be trapped right. um, into a contract and always going into after, you know, so many 
years or after each album, being able to renegotiate and into a new deal, that whole thing. So, yeah, no, I definitely, people can say a lot of negative things about record labels and Granite Capital definitely had their ups and downs because I think I went through so many different presidents while I was there. Yeah. Um, before putting an album in the middle of an album, it'd be like, oh, by the way, there's a new president of your label. <laughs> yeah. I start to like this guy. Like, what's going on? Yeah. They come in with a new agenda. Yeah. And, you know, new thoughts, wanting it to you because they want to put their stamp on it. So they're like, yeah. eh, we're not going to do it there. We're going to do it this way. So that wasn't a joy. Yeah. Going through that. Um, but, yeah, uh, they never made me feel trapped, okay. is what, yeah. You mentioned when you were young to being able to write songs, and I know you wrote stuff with your brother. Did, did you have, did you get the opportunity to sign a separate publishing deal with Capital or EMI or something or someone else? Um, yes, through EMI. And then, um, um, Obviously, we were part of the ASCAP family, and I'm still part of ASCAP. And um, and then I entered into another publishing deal later on, um, much, much later on. Um, but yeah, all of this stuff was very new to us. Like, I didn't know. I didn't know what an ASCAP was. I didn't <laughs> know what a publishing deal was. Like, all of this things that you had to learn I was just like so you just don't sing <laughs> like, yeah. we just don't go in a studio and make records no ma'am that's not it's not all you do <laughs> so, yeah but you're so. very fortunate though because um 90 of other artists that came along didn't have mom and dad um and they they signed production deals who took everything and then you know even Jodeci they were like yeah we're, we're so popular but we don't see any money and then yeah. you know, so you know, and I and I, but um, and I when I spoke to Shanice, she mentioned, you know, because her mom knew the industry and stuff, she got her fair deal, but then that also puts you on a disadvantage because they're like, oh man, we can't make money off of this person, and so they're not as keen to promote you. But it felt yeah. as if you got, you got the because they were so eager to get you, they you sort of got things fine, and they were looking forward to your success. At the yeah, they. Did. They were as I continued to get older. Um, yeah, then then it you do run into those instances where people were just like, "Oh my God, her family is everywhere." <laughs> I can't in that circle. Like it's very hard to try to pull her away from there, and you know, and um, create other situations. So no, I was grateful that my family was always around me. It just, you know, as I got older, then, you know, then things you start to break away from, from that, because then I started feeling like I really wanted to, um, you know, be my own person. I wanted to see how much of this I could do, you know, on my own, um, outside of my family. I wanted to you know, I mean, that goes with getting older, like you, you go through that. But then that's also with that, there's a lot of risk involved <laughs> because there's a lot of scary people in this industry. <laughs> so that's when it gets kind of weird. But um, in the beginning, I'm, I was truly, truly, truly grateful that my dad was always with me. He would travel with me. Um, my mom would, would, would travel with me too. Like they would split it up. Okay. So have an opportunity to go places with me too but for the most part yeah my dad went everywhere with me when I was especially when I was touring yeah how was it like recording a debut album and and you know because you know you're singing you know um at home now you're you're signed to a label in in Capital's famous recording studios and 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 now it's the, there's a I don't know if there's pressure is it fun just Oh, yeah, we're going to record your album. I mean, how did that feel like? Um, I didn't, I didn't feel any pressure. I there was like nervous energy because it's just all this excitement and the in the unknown. I didn't know what the process was going to be like, 
Um, so I was just excited. Um, yes, yeah, like I the on the first album, I worked out of Ray Parker Jr. Studios oh. and got to meet him. Americana Studios, which was like, it's historical. Is that um, and, Jimi Hendrix Studios or? Um. Okay, no, maybe not. No, no, no. His, his was something lady. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Um, but everyone had had worked out of Ray Parker Jr.'s studio. Like everybody and their mama had been there. <laughs> so I was spending lots of time in that studio. And that's where I learned that you don't go in and you sing one time and you get to go home. Like <laughs> <laughs> no one told me you'd be there for hours. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is a job. <laughs> <laughs> real job it's it's everything was started to take place it was like you go into the studio you're laying down tracks and you know at that point that's when you know people were stacking vocals so hmm. you would literally do a gazillion tracks of a gazillion vocals and a gazillion notes and they go wow. through and pick the ones they like so yeah I would be singing four hours it wasn't a matter of auto-tuning and things like that <laughs> Pro, tools, yeah. Pro tools you had to do the work if you messed up a note it wasn't it's okay I'll fix it in the yeah, mix yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. you go back out there and you have to fix it yourself and with that came a lot of discipline though as a vocalist and a recording artist so I I'm glad I was a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then I worked with Seth Riggs. Oh, the famous coach vocal coach, Michael Jackson and the rest. World of famous, yes. <laughs> Michael Jackson, vocal coach, everybody's vocal coach. So I remember going to his house and doing vocal lessons. I would do that. Then I was still in school, um, dance studios. It was a lot. My, my days were consumed, but... Um, I was having the time of my life. Like I loved every minute of it. Had you moved to LA or so? Or are you still back in Iowa? No. And that was the thing we were trying to decide because everyone, even the label was like, she should be in a performing arts school out in California. And I was like, I don't want to leave my friends. Like, I don't want to do that. And I liked, I didn't want my mom to have to give up her job either to move to Iowa. Like, None of that, that part didn't sound good to me. I was like, I don't think I want to move. So then the label said, well, you're at least going to have to get a place out here so that you can spend more time to record because I couldn't really record at home. It's not like we had a whole bunch of studios. Now yeah. there's a million studios. <laughs> and at that time, there really weren't. Yeah. So yeah, we end up, um, getting a place and that was around the time that you know my sister was graduating from high school so she was like I want to move out to California and she was going to fashion and merchandising school and she also became a stylist and worked in worked on uh, music videos wow um, so she we lived together and okay. then um my brother who wrote songs with me, he moved out. And so we ended up having the spot. So they would stay there and then I would just come back and forth. And at least okay. I was like, I go there and my siblings are here. To look after you. So it, yeah, it was it was kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, but how long, because when you go back to Iowa, do people realize you're recording an album or, or videos out or, or you know, can you just walk the streets without people taking your autograph? Of you know what's funny, and I think that's the charm of being in the Midwest or living in Iowa because most people knew who we were anyway. I mean, it's it was I grew up in a very small community that when I would come home, I was literally the same. I went to Catholic school. I put on my uniform. I'd go to school, and I was the same. I was just a kid. I didn't, I, I felt like I wasn't any different. Mm. And even though everyone else looked at me kind of differently, but then um, 
they adjusted it and it became like, oh, it's just Tracy. Like, okay. he's annoying and normal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't walking around like, you know, I'm this diva. Like, it was never like that. I was a tomboy. I was in Catholic school. I, I would play, I would go home and still play with my Barbies. I'd go roller skating. I'd ride my mm -hmm. bike around and I was just a normal kid. Wow. But by the time you were coming out, at Stacy Lass's saw come out and at Tracy's already come as so Tracy, um Shanice and you know, um mm -hmm. they and they come out so it was almost like okay, we we kind of they, they were, it wasn't just you as as a as a young artist. Was uh, had that happened or were you one of the first to come out? Um God, that's hard to show. I wanna say no, Stacy Lattisaw was before. Okay. And I, me and Shawnee's. Yeah, she she was before us. Um, I don't remember how old she was. I, I thought she was like maybe 15 or 16 or something. When okay, she so birthed. slightly older. So it, it, okay. So. Yeah. And me and Shawnee's were the youngest. Um, we're a few years apart. Um. And yeah, then you had Debbie Gibson. Debbie and Gibson, the Mo that. Tiffany, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was our little crew. <laughs> yeah. Of young. of young girls. But then in on on the male side, were there any bo young boys that were that were around? Because you know, you had. Not right at the beginning, but I do remember it might have been by my second album when you had like high five and oh, but you had the boys back in those those what about the, the boys? boys? Yeah, I got them for getting the boys, and I went on <laughs> tour with them. Oh my, God. yes, the okay. boys love them. They were so sweet. Um, yeah, I went on tour with them because we did a tour was me the boys and then I met Albie sure at that time and did a show and yeah yeah there were more oh and then there were new kids on the block yeah but they were a little bit older I mean with them off six they seventeen old. eight yeah because you came out it was yeah. 11 or 12 that's still you know still quite I'm young, still to... young yeah between me and the boys because they had yeah they were... I think was like 10 or something yeah. he was the youngest in the group and um <laughs> Yeah, but um, not many. There were definitely not many females that who were eleven and twelve that were that I was meeting or on the road with. No, there was no. not a lot. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, as I said, yeah, it, as I said, that you guys were with the um the the the, the trailblazers. But then when you, I mean, when your self titled album comes out, was there an expectation from? capital like okay you need to go gold or platinum or is it just like let's put it out there see how it goes and then we'll go back to the drawing board it was very much like that <laughs> they were hopeful um they put a lot of money into just the the record itself and the videos they wanted to make sure everything was you know it was like top tier like we're not gonna we're gonna put everything we can into this project for people to take it seriously because they knew it was going to be a challenge trying to market a child they just <laughs> you say the child <laughs> like a toddler like yeah. how do you <laughs> who wants to buy a toddler album <laughs> so it was a challenge it definitely was a challenge but um it was it was fast. It was fun because once I got on the road, then you had all these young girls who were so excited because they were like, um, they you know they were just like, oh my god, like she can do this, we can do this, and or mm -hmm. here's like this young girl that's not, you know, that seems like a pretty normal kid who's just out there living her dream, yeah, you know, having fun. And so that was, ex that was truly exciting, but I still think there, you know, there were still it's, it's some of its challenges because I also had an adult audience who were into my music because the first album also had big ballads on it, mm -hmm. um, which 
through a different group of people. And I think some people felt some kind of way where they're just like, oh, I'm a huge, you know, like, I really like this girl, but she's four. Like, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the four-year-old's record, like, this is weird. But then it became normal after a while, I think people realized, because that was, we were, we were always doing, trying to do our best, even with the label and with management and my parents to make sure I stayed looking like okay. a young yeah, even though the songs yeah. might have been a little bit more mature, but <laughs> yeah, because we didn't want to do bubblegum pop songs. We wanted people to know that you know she's not just here, you know, for a, for a minute. We're trying to. We want everyone to grow with her, and want you to know that she actually is an actual singer. And so, yeah, you had to throw those types of songs in there to show people that <laughs> I wasn't a kid. Well, you had new kid, you had new addition, pop uh, candy yeah. girl. I, mean, I thought they could have thought oh, that's a nice little bubblegum type of music that, that could have been around the I, time you came out. I think it's easier though. It's always different with guy between guys yeah. and girls. We we get viewed differently. Yeah, it's more of a challenge when you're a female artist. Yeah, I think you get judged more. Yeah, yeah, and it it it, 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 it yeah, it is hard because then who are the boys running to the shows and uh, as the, you know are the fan mails as opposed to the boys who would have lots of girls who tend to be the fans. You can sort of find an audience and and market to them as a label, I would imagine. So. Yeah. Um, did, did was there disappointment from Capital with the sales and the, and performance of the Dabler album, or did they just say, "Well, we've learned our lessons, we'll move forward"? Or how was how did they receive that? And did you know any differently? Um, I think they were happy with the way things went, and I had. Um, they were glad to see that I was able to get mainstream success, that things worked well overseas because I ended up doing a tour overseas on the first album. So I think there were a lot of surprises that they just weren't sure because they really didn't know. They went into mm. it going, we want to make this happen. We just <laughs> don't know how it's going to happen. So, <laughs> so let's just, you know, take a gamble and see. And so, yeah, that took me into the next album. And at that point, I had a new president. So that's <laughs> kind of how it all began. And going into that record, um, it had its challenges because we, you know, at that point, I was um, 13, going on 14 when I started putting that record together. Okay. And that's when I started writing. And that's where Tender Kisses um, came from, writing that with my brother. And um, that album to me was more experimental because I still wasn't like, I wasn't 18. So we couldn't be like, okay, well now she's 18. She went yeah. from 11 to 18. Let's, like, it's a huge, uh, time of growth and a lot of different experiences. It was only, you know, a couple years later. Mm. So I was still in high school. And so we just really weren't sure of the direction to go in. And um, I just remember Hel Milgram at the time, who was the president, him coming to my brother and me and him, him going, hey, I have a, I have an idea. And we're like, what's the idea? And he's he goes, you guys want to A&R your own album? What? <laughs> exactly. it's like, what? I was like, um, come again? I was like, I know nothing about doing that. I'm like, so you're telling me go find my own producers, find my own songs. Like, you want me to be, f figure out the creative direction of this project at, you know, 14 years old. And he's like, yeah. I believe you can do this. He was like, make the record you want to make. And I was scared out of my mind because I had no clue of where to begin or what to do. And I just, 
remember, okay, he gave me some, it, it's not like he walked into the office and said <laughs> that beard and went home and like, you know, had a it wasn't that he was like, here's a budget. Um, here's your staff. Like we're here to support you, but you can make the record that you want to make. Oh. And yeah. So immediately we went to work. My brother did his thing and he started, you know, we were always getting submissions. It wasn't like uh, this task of trying to find people. Okay. For me, I kind of had this thing where, you know, there's, there's a lot of talented producers and writers that were well known or whatever. I kind of looked at it as there's also the, you know, people who never get an opportunity. And I kind of looked at myself as that, you know, the girl from Iowa that by chance, I was blessed enough to be on Star Search and get a huge deal with a major label. That doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. Like someone gave me that opportunity. So we started looking at writers and producers that were just like songs that maybe um, nobody else would even think about listening to or you know, um, so yeah, we started like digging through like boxes of like that were being sent to the label of like people who were just like, hey, I want to submit a song to Tracy Spencer. And we would listen to all these songs. Some of them were up and coming producers that had produced other projects already, but no one still knew who they really, really were yet. Yeah. So yeah, it was. And it's funny because people have asked me, would you do it differently if you went back to that second album? And I would say absolutely not because it was a it was a big album for me. And, you know, Tender Kisses was a huge song for me um, off of that album. So, no, I would I would never do anything differently. I was even in charge of the artwork of the direction I went to go in. But then um, this house was charted on the Billboard 100, which was much higher than yeah. Tender Kisses. Um, yeah. But it doesn't seem to get as much play as, as Tender Kisses seems to be your signature song. I feel like that. It's funny. It's, it's um, even when I, when I was on tour with that album performing it, it would always be, yeah, This House and Tender Kisses. Those obviously were the, were two very big songs for me on that on that album and save your um, love. there's yes and save your love um but i think tinder kisses just became like that signature song where people just associate tracy spencer with with tinder kisses it was just a signature ballad classic r&b song this house um when i like i did a lot of spring breaks and it was really really big in the gay community oh okay like i had because i had so many different remixes of this house <laughs> doing spring breaks and all these like clubs um during that time and had a huge following um you know even in new york or in miami in the gay community. And that was new for me because I grew, again, I grew up in Iowa. <laughs> so, and so, um, yeah. And I, and, it, and it's funny because it opened, I, I learned a lot that second album. I learned a lot. I saw a lot and, um, had so many amazing experiences, but, um, yeah, I felt like, different groups of people gravitated towards that record because there were a lot of pop songs on there, a lot of um, dance songs, and then you had the R&B side. So it was kind of split in the middle. You, I just had, I would do different shows and it would be a different group of people here and I'd go somewhere else and do, you know, Tinder Kisses, Love Me, those songs would be a whole different <laughs> type. Of and it was, it was wild. I just, it was it was nice to see though because I felt like um, I was 
when you do music, I obviously don't do music for the masses, for people. You do what makes you feel good. Yeah. And you hope that that resonates with the rest of the world. And I could see that with the second album. I felt like that's what I felt my music was doing. Because I tried to do music that just made people feel good. Yeah. Was, was there no temptation to get an L.A. and Babyface or, or Jimmy and Terry Lewis or Teddy Riley? Because they were, they, you know, they, they always were known for hits like, you know, they did the, the Down My Heart for the Boys and Janet Jackson's Control. So was there no temptation to say, well, let me just get them to do one or two tracks on, on my Sag Davia or my sophomore album? and then have others or did you look at your budget and think if we get one of them it might skew the whole budget so we need to stay <laughs> I don't know. you know it's funny yeah I obviously who wasn't or isn't a huge fan of Babyface or you know um Jimmy and Terry Jimmy and Terry like seriously and and um Teddy Riley Obviously, I was a huge fan of all of these producers, and I don't know. I I think we, because it was my sophomore album, and I really wanted to just experiment mm -hmm. because I felt like, what if I never get this opportunity again? Like, I didn't know. It's like you really don't. I, I wasn't, a, I was, I'm very much a realist, like when it comes to just life in general. And so I know that the music industry can be a funny place and mm -hmm. like people love you today. And then they're just like, whatever, we do tomorrow. <laughs> and you learn that early on. And um, so I just felt like I'm just, here's, they're throwing money. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm like having fun. Mm. and see what happens and learn from it. I wanted mm. it to be a, yeah, I, there was enough money for me to go to a, to a baby face. There was definitely oh. money. If I would have went to the label and said, I want baby face to do half my album and baby face was like, sure, I'll do it. I think it, it would have been fine. It would have been fine. They, they capital believed in me. I, you wow. know, I felt like, that much and um I just feel like because there was so there was so much internal conflict in the label that if there wasn't that much internal conflict things would have probably played out differently too but I went through you know I was I was kind of an artist at a label that just you know there was just so much going on people were losing jobs left and right, people leaving the company, people unhappy at the company, lots of drama in that label. Um, but I would still call and be like, you know, I'm still here, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> still I got mean, a budget, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, well, was, I, right. I, and that was really sad because, you know, there was, because um, here in the UK we had EMI and of course then you mm -hmm. had the, the big six back in the day and then they started merging and they thought about, you know, they were, they were trying to make money. So it just meant labels were just chopping and black yeah. music departments seemed to have taken the brunt of that. Um, even though the 90s was a booming time for R&B, they but they just, they just really just took the hit from that. Then how then yeah. do you, you know, you've got a really good album out. You've got three big singles that are going out there. And then there's Of He Will Behind You. How do you, are you just going on tour, promoting the album and hoping that things will clear up by the time you're ready to do album number three? Or what, what, how, what goes through your mind? You do hope that <laughs> things will start to balance, balance themselves out. And you're just like, um hoping things get a little bit better and a little bit easier and and they don't <laughs> for the most part. and they don't <laughs> you can be hopeful <laughs> and that's kind of when i was um started having issues within my own group 
of people, meaning like management, we started having issues <clears throat> and things just got to a point where I literally wasn't having fun anymore. Um, Cause then the label got out of black music. They're like, Oh, guess what guys? No more black music department. Wow. And I wow. went, you do know you have people here that do R and B, right? Like I'm just wondering <laughs> <just, laughs> <just> <laughs> if you remember there's a lot of black music here. <laughs> uh, yes, I do pop, but <laughs> wow. I like music. So um I just it's so funny because there's part of me I think that, you know, it suppressed a lot of stuff during that period. Um, towards the end of the second album and um, that I just have like these mo of flashes where I just remember walking into the label and going to the floors that housed urban music and then being empty. Wow. It was like a ghost town. Lights were off. Literally. And that's a weird experience and a weird feeling. And then that, then you're a teenage girl and you're just like, I don't, you know, here comes another president. Here comes new staff, new ideas. And I, um, oh, and then there's problems with management. Um, I'm growing up, so I'm going through all these different physical changes, mental changes, emotional changes as a young woman. It's, it was a lot at all at once that I shut down. And when I shut, say shut down, I spiraled in, into a depression. And um, I just remember being in, in California and not leaving my room for two weeks. And not communicating with anyone. I was just, I checked out. And I could feel it coming. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you feel like you're on the brink of something bad is about to happen. And I thought I could get ahead of it. Or just, you know, you start, you ignore it. You think yeah. like, I'm going to be fine. No, then you wake up one day and you literally physically can't get out of bed. And I didn't know what that was. I, then I didn't know it was depression. Um, and I just remember my brother becoming very concerned very fast and telling my parents like something's really wrong. And my dad flew out and um, literally got me out of bed and said, you're going home. And that, that was a, a pivotal point for me because um, it's funny because it's, it's, it's weird to talk about because I don't talk about it. It's not something that I share with a lot of people. And there's, I think it's one of those things that people, most of the world doesn't know about me um, that I went through something like that. But I think it's, I feel like it's something I need to share with people just because um, it's, it's a part of my story and it's kind of how I've gotten from there to where I am now, those types of, you know, going through that, that experience. But yeah, I remember coming back home and I even had like agoraphobia for a little while. I couldn't go anywhere. The plane ride home, let me tell you, oh, yeah. that was next to impossible. Oh. <laughs> it was unbearable. I had a panic attack in the airport. Um, I had to wear like a hoodie because I just needed to feel like I was closed in. I didn't want people looking at me. Um, it was a, it was literally a nightmare. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. 
I was horrified as to what was happening to me. And I just remember going home and, you know, my, the first thing my mom did was just hold me. Like she hugged me forever and it was the best feeling in the world. But without even speaking, she knew that that's what I needed at that time. And should I have gone to a doctor? Should I have gotten a therapist then probably, but, um, my family just protected me. I stayed home. I remember my dad calling the label and saying, or calling, have, or calling my attorney and saying, as of right now, she's not doing anything. I don't care what commitments there are. You, you know, like you deal with it. But my daughter's health is more important than anything right now. And I think I was, I was only home for like a month or two. And then I remember saying, I think I'm ready to go back and deal with things. And at that point, there was money <laughs> that needed to be owed back to the label. <laughs> there were, cause there were a lot of commitments that I just didn't uphold on my side because I was be spiraling. I was becoming very unhappy and I couldn't do the work. And I was just like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. Like, this is stupid. I don't want, like, this is insanity. Like I'm not having fun. And I've said this before. My mom always would say that to me. And she said, the minute you're not having fun at doing anything, you stop. Mm -hmm. Like, don't work for yourself. Don't feel like you need to do something because other people expect you to do it. Um, whatever, whatever needs to be dealt with, um, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I just remember, you know, right now at the top of my head, because I can't really remember who the president of the label was at the time. Um, but I remember getting on a private jet, going to New York with my dad to have a meeting with, um, the label and um, walking into the office and and I remember him just saying, how can we make you happy? What can we do? Because we don't want you to leave, but you are under a contract, <laughs> <laughs> young lady. And you know, when they put you on a private jet and have you go, <laughs> to a secret location, to an office you've never been to before. Wow. wow. <laughs> Where they have like literally a waitress coming and bringing you food and drinks. And you're like, this is like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Very surreal that, um, and it's just you and your dad. Um, my dad's comment was, We tear up the contract. We start a new deal. She owes nothing. We go in with a clean slate. And well, she goes back into the studio. My dad said that. I didn't say that. I was just sitting there like not having really anything to say because I still didn't. I just was so confused by everything. I was like, this is now it's become... Now I'm seeing what the music industry really is all about. Mm. Like, that's what I felt like. It went from, oh, it's fun and games. You get in hair and makeup. You have fun. You shoot expensive videos and you travel the world and meet cool people. Now is in a position where reality had settled in and, it, and you realize it was a business. That a label is a bank and you're a commodity. Like, you know what I mean? And you're yeah. like, it is what it is. It's not all fun and games. Mm. And um, I just remember us shaking hands and that contract was ripped up and gone. And I didn't owe them anything. And we started off fresh. Without a lawyer there. Wow. Without a lawyer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I would never advise that to anyone now, but... Yeah. Um, my dad was a big guy. Okay, okay. <laughs> People were scared of my dad. And my dad scared of no one. 
because I was his child and Mm -hmm. he would do anything to protect me. So he didn't care who these people were. Um, if you heard, it was in my dad's mentality has always been, you hurt my kid. I hurt you. That kind of, (laughs) you have to deal with me. That's my dad. And yeah, they agreed to our terms and I thought, well, I'm going to leave and everything's going to be fine again. And it got that much harder because that's when I went back in the, into the studio again, I always felt like I had an unlimited budget because it was, it wasn't hard to ask for something. Um, and I rarely heard no as you know, but I didn't ask for like crazy, crazy stuff. I wanted to work. So I wasn't like asking for like wild stuff. I was just like, Hey, I want to work with this person. Can we make it happen? Or how do we do this? Um, and it, you know, we, they would help, you know, we'd work out these deals, but I ended up working, you know, with people from Queen Latifah's camp. I went to New York and demoed some songs and then I end up as like a few songs. And then I, um, a couple of upcoming songwriters and producers. Then I even ended up going into a deal with Dallas Austin and spent a lot of time in Atlanta working on an entire project. And these were projects that ended up getting shelved. But however, recently I found out that they've been leaked on YouTube. And <laughs> yeah, was that the album Natural or something like that? Naturels on there, and then there's um, another project that was that has been released to online. Um, but yeah, so I was working. It wasn't that I wasn't working. I was doing that, and then I was also doing soundtracks. Mm-hmm. Um, Good Burger and um, a smile like yours down Delta, in the Delta. Down the Delta, yeah. Mm-hmm. What, so, what, what was was it? Um, did Family Matters help Tender Kisses sort of become bigger, being appearing on Family Matters? Did that also um, was that? A... Oh, by of course. Um, TGI Fridays when Friday nights when you had Full House and all of those shows, yeah, yeah, yeah. and everybody was watching those shows at the end of the week. Definitely, that helped a lot because that was a huge, huge show. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was great for that experience too. That was so much fun. I, I mean, being asked to, to 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 be part of that as a, you know was that nerve wracking? Did, did turning to some mini acting? No, because you know it's funny when you're around peers, like you know people your own age. Um, you they kind of like being around Darius and the rest of the cast, like they, they made it more fun and less about, about it being work. Yeah. So they were, they were, I would just remember them saying like, just have fun. Like you can't take it seriously. Just be you and have fun. So yeah, I, I loved it. That was, that was a good time. Because you, you, the, the, um, um, your sophomore album came out. Um, was it? Was, let me try and see now. I think it was um, ninety. Yeah, it was actually about um, ninety one. Yeah, um, don't ask me to add the dates. No, yeah, <laughs> it was actually ninety one. Um, no, well, ninety one is when the singles came out. No, so the album "Make a Difference" came out in nineteen ninety, and then you were releasing "Tender Kisses" ninety one, ninety two, and but yeah. we didn't get. It's all about you until ninety nine. Mm-hmm. You're saying within that um, eight year time span, you recorded two albums. One with Pretty Dallas much. Austin, and then one with people like when and in Flavor Units Camp. Yeah, we were and yeah, and there were songs with um, other songwriters and producers in the middle. Of that I had, I had a lot of music. Wow. There were a lot. Yeah, that people may never well maybe they'll hear them one day but yeah there's a there were a, there were a lot of songs yeah well you said was it because you finished one album you hand it into capital and they've got a new president says oh i didn't authorize this can we go back 
or what, what was going what happened when you've you know completed well you get you get new a and r you get new marketing you get new everything and it was just um a lot of it i think they were trying to buy time because there okay. was there was so much drama within the label that it was just like it's not ready yet or let's try that. Let's keep recording. And I always feel like when people tell you to do that, it's because they're just, they're not ready to put it out. They don't really, there's too, there's, there's stuff going on that I don't need to know about or, yeah. <laughs> you know, that. Yeah. So it was, I it, it, do the work, uh, you know, because I wanted to stay busy. So I felt like, okay, I'll keep recording as long as you guys keep giving me money. <laughs> oh, yeah, but yeah, that's the thing. So they could, it's cheaper to pay for you to just record, but they were merging with EM, um, they were merging with, with different labels all coming together. And I would assume yeah. the money to release and promote an album would have affected merges. So they would have just said, yeah, just stay at the background so we don't have to go in for that whole... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's cheaper just to keep. Yeah, you're right. It's cheaper to keep you just go record. Go record something. Yeah. You missed a massive because the 90s was massive when it came to R&B. I mean, you had, you know, Jade, SWV, you had everyone just blowing up. And it was R&B, you know, was was massive. And at the peak of that, we didn't hear from you. I mean, apart from for a few soundtracks, I mean, how was that like? Just you know, what what did how did that feel like personally? Just being not allowed to take advantage of the fact that everyone was out there making music and 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 R and B was really well received. It was well, there was this internal struggle because part of me, yeah, I felt like I was missing out on a lot because I was like, I really like recording's great, but I'm like you you start to get to you get burnt out too mm -hmm. and i was becoming exhausted and things you know some songs i was like these are great other things i was like what this isn't what i the direction i want to go in and you just are like i i want to get back out there and then the other part of me was you start getting all kinds of people saying just get out of your contract leave the label go somewhere else. It's not like you can't get another deal, sign a production deal with someone. And I think I could have done all of those things, but it's again, uh, you know, at that point I had been, it's like being in a relationship. Mm -hmm. They were the first label mm -hmm. to sign me. I was a 11 year old girl and I'd been through so much with them mm -hmm. that it was hard to go I'm just going to leave them. It was the, that feeling of the, that fear, Yeah. but I couldn't jump all in. I wasn't that much of a daredevil that I thought, yeah, I'm going to leave and I'm going to get me another deal somewhere else. I kept thinking, what if I leave and I'm knocking on these other labels doors and they're like, but we got such and such and such and such. So you're going to be on the back burner. Because mm. at that point there was an explosion of so you know more female artists or female yeah. groups, you know TLC and everybody, you yeah, know, like yeah, you said, yeah. me, that I thought I'm going to get lost in the mix. I won't be so unique there. I was still unique at Capitol because there weren't a bunch of Tracy Spencer. Yeah. And so yeah, you just like, what do you do? Do you stick it out? They're not kicking me off the label. Mm. It's like, I just, it was like a safe space. Yeah. I felt like, well, I'm kind of safe here because <laughs> no one's, you know, they're, they're not letting me go. They're just saying, Hey, here's, here's some more money. Go sing some, go record some songs. <laughs> are, are they giving you a salary? I mean, how, do, do, you know, are, are you getting no, a salary? No, it was just, it wasn't even that I, I did do pretty well from like touring and um, so, so no, well, yeah, they would give, obviously they would take care of me if I needed to go somewhere and be like when I went to Atlanta, I think I was there for over a month 
all expenses were paid. I did, none of that came out of my pocket, like staying where I was staying or travel or anything like that. So I can't talk too bad about Capitol Records because no, 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 no. They, they treated me well for a very long time. Now they had their issues and there were other issues going on at that company to certain people. But um, for the most part, um, I, I know they believed in me and um, they just, you know, they didn't know what to do after a while. They just, but they, but they knew, but I knew, you know, they didn't want to let me go. So it wasn't until, you know, I decided, I think I just want to go. And that was, you know, kind of after the, um, the last out. Yeah. But we, we, able to, during that seven hours, yes, were you able to go on tour? Um, no, I did shows here and there, but could I have? Yes. Could I have done more touring? Could I have gone overseas and probably stayed for a few months and just did a bunch of shows and racked up a whole lot of money? Yeah. Did I do that? No, <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I was, I didn't, um, it was, a, it was, to be honest, it was just a very weird time because like I said, I had spent a big portion of my life growing up in the music industry. And then I was evolving into a young woman mm -hmm. and having all of these other experiences and then trying to figure out how to, you know, be a business woman in this, in this industry, trying to separate myself from my family because I wanted to um, be more in control of my career, getting new management, like, it was a lot of stuff going on. And then at the same, you know, at the same time, I was just, I think I was, I was starting to get burnt out. Yeah. Did, did um, cause it sounded like Janet recording control, you know, my father, <laughs> which he tried to like, okay, I'm going to take control of my distress and make, and go my own direction. Or, you know, I'm coming from a close family. How, how does that work where you, you're trying to, you know, because your parents and family have always been there. How do you then try and become your own person without them feeling like you're hurting them? They. The funny thing is they didn't feel like that. Um, the relationship I had with my parents was probably different from a lot of, with the exception of like maybe Shanice and her mom. Mm -hmm. I think Shanice can probably probably relate more um, to the type of relationship or that dynamic between her and her and her mom and me and my dad. Um, <clears throat> we just, my dad knew that I was getting older, and he had, you know, my mom would be like, you know, she's she's becoming an adult. She's a, she's a grown woman now. Like you're gonna kind of have to let her figure things out on her own. And there was that part of me who was like, I really need to see if I can do this, mm -hmm. with, you know, still, I know that they'll always be there, but not with me 24 seven. Like, can I do this? Can I just deal with management on my own? Can I, can I be this businesswoman and figure this stuff out? And then you realize as soon as you start to separate from family, that's kind of when, vultures come in <laughs> yeah that's what they <laughs> to put it nicely or lightly the game changes and then it becomes um survival of the fittest or just how do you keep your sanity and what's right what's wrong who do you trust um, and then you learned you trust no one at a certain point. You just go, lesson learned, trust no one. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it kind of gets like that. It gets are, weird. Are you able to, um, are your brothers not around, your older sisters, you know, really, are, are, are you separating from them as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, Dino and I 
he started kind of going on to his own journey and I really won't speak on him because that's his story to tell mm -hmm. and I don't want to talk about his business unless you know I have permission to I just I won't do that to my brother but we kind of grew apart basically and <clears throat> my sister at that point yeah she got out of the industry she was doing fashion and doing you know working on videos and stuff and then she transitioned and went back to school to San Francisco State University and became a school teacher wow so her life completely changed and she's still a teacher she's yeah. a special ed teacher and um which is wonderful she's great at what she does but um yeah everybody just you know we were all getting older everybody was just kind of doing their own thing and you do start to to grow apart there's you think that I think many people kind of thought that, oh, me and my brother will be connected forever. Because you're songwriting partners and everything. Yeah. But we just be, you know, we kind of grew apart in that sense. Um, we're, yeah. we're very close now. Like we've gotten close, closer again, but it was just a point where we were just growing apart. He was going a different path. I was going a different path. And then I was also very, um, um, I was still very frustrated with the industry because, it, you, you know, you have a love-hate relationship with the music industry. Yeah. You know, I think everybody who's in it, you know, does. Yeah, no, especially for females, because I, I, I remember speaking to Nikki Howard, and she was saying how much harder it is for females for uh, in the industry to deal with a lot and, and the respect and, 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 you know, you spoke about um, met capital being full of men who were trying to decide how to decide a career of a four, eleven year old child, then you're twenty one, twenty two year old woman, and the industry is still full of men who have um every different motives and and you know without um you know not as you know things have changed right now to some degree, but. You know, just imagine going. In my, I can't. We can't imagine how hard it is to navigate the industry of uh, 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 being in LA at that stage. Um, and, and as I said, no one can know how things are. Um, mm -hmm. What then happens when Ray Law uh, Ray Lott comes into Capital, and you know decides, okay, let's let's record. It's all about you. Uh, you know what was happening where you just recording your 200 song and he says oh we're gonna try and put an album off on you, and you put, what, 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 what did you know how was that well initially that's what you know my re response was like i loved Roy a lot i thought he was so cool i mean i liked i liked gary gersh too who was a president before Ray, uh, roy lot he just had a lot of obstacles and a lot of challenges he had to deal with. But mm. um, Roy Lott came in and, and he just, you know, his thing was, I'm going to restore faith back into you. <laughs> yeah, so seven like, years, he, he yeah, brought me out I'm of like, the cave. Good, yeah, I'm like, good luck, bro. Good luck with that. <laughs> and he had a plan. He had a plan. He had a budget. He had a plan. He said, this is how we're going to do it. You know, and that's, you know, because he was the one who brought up So Shock and Carlin and said, I think they should be the ones to help you put this album together. And um, he was like, let's let's get back to work and get this album out. And I was like, am I really going to put a record out? Like, is it really going to happen this time? And he's like, it's really going to happen this time. He's like, I promise it's going to happen. So. I do. It's I. I think it's funny, like when Soul Shock and I were talking recently. I think he puts it best. Where, and and part of me doesn't remember certain things, but when he first met me, how he just said that he could tell I was done. Yeah, I was like, ah, eh, whatever. Push records, people. <laughs> <laughs> 
let me just sing this song. I was very much like that. And it's funny because a lot of stuff I don't remember because I really was just kind of like a robot. I was just going through the motions. Mm. I yeah. was a little bit burnt. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he said that, um, yeah, that you, you just weren't really there. And Carlin was the one who sort of brought in the humor and really tried to build that trust and restore the trust. But it was, it felt as if you'd been so much burnt that, yeah, here we go again, another two years of doing this and be told it's it's not going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, um, when the things turn around, did you have to build trust with them to be able to say, okay, I'm going to take the process a lot seriously? Or, or what made you, what gave you the faith to really put your all in, 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 in the album? Um. I think like what Soshak said, it's like me and Carlin clicked our personalities. I mean, I clicked with both of them really well because my personality is um, I don't like to take myself too seriously. I want to have fun, but I want to do the work. And they're very much like that. Cracking jokes. We just, I think um, it didn't, it didn't take too long before literally I felt comfortable being around them and realizing that they're like, hey, look, this is another opportunity to get to get an album out and for you to do your thing and show people that you have staying power and that you're, you know, you are a real artist. So let's just let's just get to work. Let's just do this. But at the same time have, you know, have fun. So we experimented with ideas and um I just remember being in the studio all the time with them and and we would just record until we, you know, until we got it right. And they made it more of a pleasurable experience again and reminded me that, yeah, it's a music business, but when you're recording music, you should be having fun because you mm. want that to translate into, you know, your vocals. And when people listen to it, that they're like, oh, she, you know, you can tell this was a fun project to put together. And um, yeah, so I, it, they became, they instantly became like family because we were spending so much time together. Yeah. How much of um, the things you'd done over the past seven years were you able to bring into the project or was it like whatever I'd done the last seven years, just throw it up in the bin? No, everything's none on of it. that none of that was really a part of that project. Wow. We started from scratch as far as I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Did, did you get back into writing on, on the album or was it pretty much, yeah, whatever you do, I'm just singing along. Did you, did you were you able to go back? No, to I was writing on that album too. Yeah, because like I'll be there for you. I co-wrote with Carlin and Peter Beaker, who is also Danish I'm from Denmark. Um, gosh, my brain is so bad. I can't remember. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. That. But you you got back into <laughs> into writing and stuff. I did. I found my voice again to do that, and so I, you know. A, appreciate or I owe that to them too because I you know had shut down so much that I wasn't really writing either so mm. yeah I mean then uh, you know you're re releasing videos how how did you think it's all about you got was re got received when you look back I I remember many people's reactions um, being really positive because um, I think people were waiting for in a young woman now. It's like we've seen the kid now. <laughs> <laughs> who is she going to become? Like, what type of adult is she going to become? Who? who what will the transition be like? And I think it was a good transition for me that just that record, because again, I, um, I've always tried my best not to be um, 
hypersexualized. Like there's, it, I'm fine. People can do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Like I don't judge anybody on what they do or whatever. Um, I'm comfortable in my skin. Um, just like the next, you know, woman. But um, for me, it's just, um, I still want it. I really wanted people to still take or, you know, to really focus on the music and me as as a vocalist. So I was trying to fit in. Yes, I'm now this woman, but then there's still these other parts of me because I'm, you know, I'm still, you know, a tomboy at heart, too. And um, I think there's a lot of sides, a lot of different sides to me. I can be very soft. I can be very edgy. Not everybody gets to see all these different sides of me either. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to find that balance in this, in this album and then continue to grow from there. Um, But little did I know that after that album, then I was like, I'm done with this. (laughs) (laughs) I just don't think there'll be another album right away. At least not with this, you know, with Capitol anymore, because it just had gotten so frustrating but but when yeah. you came out in, in 1999 2000 the, the industry changed so much you know you know mm-hmm. we you know you came out in the 80s where you know you could wear a dress like phyllis phyllis Harmon or, or patty labelle and you know luther you know suits by the time you came out in the 90s it, it, it was almost striptease singers you know it, it, in fact we <laughs> We weren't looking for singers. We were looking for models to, for, who could just be lip sync. I mean, that was so to come out yeah. and 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 you said not you you've always been in the sense of not being overly sexualized, but that was what labels were pushing and you know had mm-hmm. women's videos. So it must have been like wow, you know, you must have been in hibernation and coming out and realized, well, this is not the industry I remembered. It must have been yeah. hard to try and get that album pushed. I'm trying to be yourself. Yeah, like I said, it was it was definitely a challenge um, because I was just only I was only willing to go so far. Um, I never wanted anyone to push me out of my um, comfort zone. And it was it was becoming to that point where it was like everyone was showing more skin and not that I personally had a problem with it. I was just like, that's not really what I want to do. That's just not what I want to do. But yeah, the label would push for it. I remember even in it's all about you. And even though the shots are very fast and brief, I was wearing like a bando top and like itty bitty shorts. And I'm like straddling (laughs) Datari Turner, who was the model in the video. And that was out of my comfort zone. <laughs> that was definitely, but I, you know, I did it and was like, that's as far as we go, people. Wow. <laughs> like that's, that's as far as I'm gonna gonna take it because I just didn't want that to be the focus. You know, I just um yeah. and like I said, not that I'm I mean, I'm I'm fine in my own skin. I don't have a problem with with you know with stuff like that. It's just, um, at that point, I was, I still feel like I I had a lot to prove. I wasn't going to go from like, okay, now I'm just going to bear all. And this is who I am. Like, no, you're going to get it in bits and pieces. And I think, you know, um, you know, uh, and, and, and still trying to, to be me at the same time. Like I still felt like people didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. And I was still trying to get people to go, oh, that's that's who Tracy Spencer is. I, you know, it's hard to try to do that when you're 11, 12, 13, 14, when you're still in that that box. But now I was like, okay, now I'm 21, 22. So now I can start revealing other parts of my personality and who I am. And so after the album, and then you did your videos, did you have a conversation with Ray and said, you know what, I, I think I can't continue? Or, or, or did they say, yeah, look, we've put some money in it, it didn't work, so we're dropping you? What how, what, is, what happens? Well, that's the thing. The album was 
successful. You know, when I go back, I I really think there were other singles on that album. Things just again internal conflicts at the at the label, um, management issues. Uh, that things just weren't being executed the way they should. We started running out of time, and um, I just I was frustrated and the longer time went by and I did shows and did some touring with that album, I was just like, I think this relationship has come to an end. Like, I think wow. it's time for us to break up. <laughs> you know, I felt like me and Capital needed to break up. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it was, and that was the thing too. It wasn't hard letting me go or to leave to get out of my contract none of that like I I will always say I'm I've been blessed mm -hmm. with the deals I made with that label and and then getting out of um, my contract and leaving um, it could have been much more difficult yeah a more, you know worse a more difficult experience but no I left and I took a break. I just was like, because in the middle of all that too, I had signed, um, I had, be before starting that album, I had signed with Next Modeling Agency. I was doing some modeling. I did, you know, walk a few runways wow. for like Chanel and other um, Tommy Hilfiger. I was doing stuff like that. Um, but after leaving, I just felt like here's a time where I just need to just detach myself from everything mm. and figure out who I am and what I really want. And so did you? A people, that's a bad idea. I had more people tell me that's that's a horrible idea. You can kill your career that way. And I thought, you know what? Um, but I'm losing my mind. So yeah, it's yeah, either... Yeah. I got to do what's best for me. Because people fight to get into the industry and you're in there and you're trying to come out. And for, for most people, it's like, well, what are you doing? I mean, I'll kill to, do, to be you, but without realizing that you could die being you if you don't get out. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you can go and burn yourself completely out to the point of you lose yourself. Um, you know, it's an industry where so many people either try to take advantage of you, you, I mean, drugs, alcohol, that's everywhere. Mm. Um, and at some point, some people fall into those traps in order to maintain or to survive. Mm -hmm. And I just knew for my own sanity that it could either end badly mm -hmm. or I do the right thing and walk away from it all and just try to figure stuff out mm -hmm. <laughs> the right way. Like have a like step back from it, look at it from a different perspective, figure it out. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, um, I'll have to see. I don't know. You know, I just, I didn't know. But I knew I I didn't think too hard about it because I just um, I I needed to maintain my sanity. I was like I don't want to be depressed anymore. I don't want to go through that again. And mm -hmm. yeah, did did you move back to Iowa then, or did you just stay in LA for a while? Um, what did I do? No, I did. I do after that album. No, I was in LA. Oh yeah, I was in LA for a while. Yeah, I was dating. Good relationships, bad relationships. <laughs> I was living a normal life. <laughs> um, I did traveling. I did a lot of stuff like that. I was trying to just... Um, I was on the search of trying to find myself. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I couldn't do it being in the industry. 
I felt like I was going to lose myself or was losing myself being in it. I needed to get out for a minute. But, but being being outside of it and, and all these relationships and things, how do you then decide you know, how do you decide how to make sure that you, you're getting the right balance? Did you, I would have thought staying in LA was probably part of the, the problem because everyone's trying to get in and it's a rat race. So did you, were you okay just living in LA and not being a, being a performer? I was okay. I was okay with being in LA, not being a performer because um, I w it wasn't like I wasn't doing any work. I was still sometimes like having writing sessions, okay. doing stuff like that. Um, literally, though, just exploring life and just trying to do normal stuff. And then I had my sister who, you know, was living out in California and um, spending more time with her, okay. spending more time with my family. Uh, coming home more often because it got to a point where I wasn't even coming home as often as I used to and spending time with my parents. Um, at that point, my oldest brother was starting his family. So I was coming home and babysitting and spending time <laughs> doing normal stuff. And it was what I really needed. Mm -hmm. I needed to do it. I, it's like I... I could tell it's what I needed to do. I really did. And um, traveling, just kind of doing whatever I wanted to do and didn't have to answer to anybody um, or have or have any expectations mm. put on me. And then you start to see um, more people coming out, doing music, and then you start to feel like, oh, I think I miss it a little <laughs> bit. That that uh that that sensation where you're just like, oh, I think I kind of miss it. And then you start running into people who are just like, why aren't you singing? Why aren't you doing that? Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, it's not as easy as you think it is, or it's not a short story. Like, yeah. You know, Sit down and let me make you a few cocktails and explain <laughs> to you some of the stuff, you know? And, you know, there, I mean, there's things that, you know, you and I haven't even, you know, talked about. There's things that I probably won't talk about that I endured or experienced in the industry. That might be for a book at some point, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think getting out when I did was probably the best decision I ever made. Yeah. But when did you decide to leave California? What, what, what triggered that? What kind of triggered that was um, my, at one point, being that me and my mom were so close, her wanting me to come home even more often than I was. And I just remember coming home one Christmas and I said, you know what, mom, I'll stay longer than just through Christmas. Like, how about I stay for a few months? And she, and my mom's always like, you guys can like all her kids, all of you can stay here forever. Like you don't ever have to go. To <laughs> like she's like, that. she loves having her, her kids around. And I was like, well, I'm not going to stay forever, but, and I was in a relationship at the time too. And, um, but I said, I'll stay for a little bit. And it might've been, I don't know. It was like a couple months later that my dad started not doing well. He was having these weird pains. And um, I remember going, making two trips to the ER and the second trip, they called the following morning and said, um, you guys need to go to the cancer center and meet with this doctor. And it's, you know, it's like when someone calls you and tells you that in the morning, it doesn't really process. Mm -hmm. You're just like cancer center, 
doctor's name, what time? Okay. That's kind of how my mom took the message. And she woke me up and said, we got to take your dad to the cancer clinic in a couple hours. So get dressed. And I'm like, does she even know what she just said to me? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. So after going, them doing a biopsy and my dad being diagnosed with um, AML, leukemia. Wow. Um, everything changed for me then. And I made a conscious decision to, oh, I had to decide in my, um, what am I going to do? Because my mom, um, you know, that's her life partner. And she, I could just, you know, that the day we got the results back and the look in her eyes, I just knew she was not going to be able to do this by herself. And I immediately, which has always kind of been my personality too, I just, something clicked in. I said, I got to figure this out. And the people can call it convenient or that, oh, well, you know, it's just that it worked out that way. I hadn't started a family of my own. So it was kind of easier for me to make that decision of leave where I'm at and move back home and help, you know, my mom and dad. So at first I was kind of going back and forth and then I made the decision where I said, I, I need to be here. And, <clears throat> and I, um, they had kind of told us that, you know, my dad would probably have 12 months. And I just remember like, Like, yeah, I would take him to chemo during the week, a couple times during the week. But it's funny because like, it's, it's hard as it's to, that's to talk about too, because this is the month that my dad passed. Um, the best memories I have during that time was he loved Bruno Mars. <laughs> and we get in the car and we would play Bruno Mars to chemo every time and sing along to Bruno Mars going and leaving chemo and we did that the entire 12 months it was like clockwork he had to listen to Bruno Mars to get himself like pumped up to do chemo and, um yeah and I yeah I became the, the person that would take him all the time it was, it was very hard for my mom and I, I could see that. Sometimes she would go and sit with him, um, but it was hard watching just the physical changes and um, that he went through. And yeah, that was, that was a tough time, but I do have good memories. I think it transformed our relationship. We now had a different relationship than we did when I was, a child because yeah you go through those parts too where it's not always great with your parents you have your differences because you're getting older and you're just like ah you guys don't know anything <laughs> I did that and my you know me and my dad would get into these dumb little arguments but this kind of brought us back together again where we connected with music and um he uh would tell me things that I don't think he told anybody else in the family and We'd share these stories and these in these moments together. And he would ask me what I really thought about what was happening to him, or if I believed in, do I really believe in heaven? And do I believe in God? And because my dad was not a religious man. Mm -hmm. Like we were Catholic, but he only went to church on holidays. <laughs> <laughs> he spent Christmas here. And he, you know, he he was a man of God, like he believed in God, but he just he wasn't a church going, he didn't read the Bible or anything like that. But um, yeah, we started having these really deep conversations about what happens in the afterlife and where do people really go? And, you know, he got to a point where he wasn't afraid anymore as to what was going to happen. So after that, 
it became harder for me to go back to California. Music was really not a priority at that point for me. Mm -hmm. um, because then I saw my mom in her big house now alone after my dad passed and she was depressed. And that was hard to watch. And she didn't want to move to California. She didn't want to do any of those things. She was mm -hmm. like, no, I'm going to stay here. You know, and then we all get together as siblings and everyone has the conversation of mom needs to sell the house and mom needs to <laughs> move into a, a smaller apartment and do this. And she was like, I'm not leaving the house. And I was supporting anything and everything that she wanted to do mm -hmm. because I didn't know what it felt like to be in her shoes to mm -hmm. lose your life partner. I just knew from being, you know, from the perspective of being a daughter, losing a parent, mm -hmm. it's not the same. Mm -hmm. It's not the same grief and it doesn't feel the same. Um, and I understood that we started going to grief counseling together mm -hmm. That's good. and it was, it was great. We started journaling, mm -hmm. um, and I think it helped it helped her a great deal. And it helped me a lot too, because it, again, it transformed my relationship with my mom. Mm. And I was, it was like, um, like going through these, these different changes or experiences really helped me evolve as a person or just evolve as, as a woman because I had been living a, a certain life mm -hmm. for a while. And now I was having like these, some trauma, some traumatic experiences, <laughs> some real life shit was happening. Yeah. And um, I had to navigate through that and figure it out. And um, I'm, you know, I look back and I'm grateful for all of the experiences I had um, as painful as many of them were. Mm. But yeah, and then we, so then at that point, I was still kind of going back and forth. But um, then I started going on that journey of healthcare too. And then that's, you know, and, you know, before that, that and that's when the psychology thing came up. And I was just like doing all of these different things. Mm. And music was just literally on the back burner I wasn't touring or I wasn't traveling I wasn't singing anywhere none of that none of if you wanted to catch a performance of Tracy Spencer you'd have to come to the house and hear me <laughs> singing in the backyard or in just yeah in the house but I wasn't performing anywhere I wasn't even writing I couldn't even that was blocked mm. I couldn't even have the ability to write a song mm. um, yeah so fast forward um, during COVID, then my mom gets diagnosed with uh, lung cancer and not a smoker, any of that. She had some health issues, but nothing that would have um, or yeah, would have made us think, oh, she's going to get lung cancer. Like, no, nothing mm -hmm. like that. So in yeah 2020 she um the year before she was having some issues but it wasn't until that January of 2020 that they confirmed that that's what was happening uh -uh. and and it was like the same thing they're like 12 months wow and you're like no like this can't this cannot be happening again i wasn't i was definitely not ready for that um and she um she only did chemo because she we asked her to <laughs> I guess. Oh, wow. she didn't really want to it wasn't something she really wanted to do and you know, she, she wanted to be here. She just didn't want 
to have to fight so hard to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like she worked in healthcare. She she saw people. She saw my dad go through and see how or see how chemo changed him. Mm -hmm. And it was it was um it was a difficult process. And she even you know my mom's a big believer. You know she's you know my mom's a was a woman of God is. You know, but she also was into alternative healing. So like uh, Reiki, she was into that. We were going to a Reiki healer, doing stuff like that. And which actually helped her get through chemo. Mm. Um, it helps take away some of the side effects. But uh, watching my mom change too was very difficult and I went through a period where then I started to compartmentalize everything mm -hmm. and I was I Tracy no longer existed it mm -hmm. was I had a goal or I had just I became a different person and it was literally 24 7 taking care of my mom making sure she, making sure she had everything she needed when she needed I don't I don't recall sleeping for a year. Mm -hmm. Like I do not recall actually having a, a real sleep because mm -hmm. after she went to the ER a couple of times and then decided she no longer wanted to do chemo, we put her on hospice because oh. she wanted to be in her home. And um, I slept next to her in the living room for the remainder and I do not recall sleeping. I think I stared at her most, <laughs> most of the time when everybody else was like, you need to go to sleep, you need to eat. And I was like, I'm good, I'm good. Like, don't, like, don't, let me just mm -hmm. figure this out. Because I was trying to prepare myself or figure out how different life was going to be without both parents when you're super close with your parents yeah, trying to figure out what that was going to be like. And I couldn't wrap my, my head around that. And so when she passed that same feeling I had when I was 16, 17 with the depression all came back to me again. Mm -hmm. And this time it was maybe 10 times worse for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I, um, man, my si I, you know, I owe my sister a lot because I tell her this, and I don't know if she even takes it seriously, but she really did save my life because um, after losing my mom, she was the next thing that I was super close to. Me and my sister have an amazing relationship and I, um, yeah, nothing else really mattered to me. And she tried to pull me out of it. And I remember we did like a sister vacation and I had just told her, I said, um, you know, I don't know if I really want to do this life thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know if it's, it's not that cute to me anymore. <laughs> I want to do it. And, you know, people say that you get concerned, right? You know, even though I'm, I pretty much make jokes all the time and, you know, that's what my family knows me for just kind of being silly and funny. Mm -hmm. But my sister looked at me like, that's not very funny. <laughs> mm, yes. This is not a joke. And so she was very worried about me leaving her and not being around a lot of people and so she it became everyone calling me all the time are you okay what are you doing where are you at <laughs> pick up everyone went crazy like where is she and in a state of panic but I did I just I got to a point where I just didn't really think I wanted to do this anymore and that's a horrible place to be in a horrible place to be in yeah. and so I went to you know I heard enough people telling me go get help. And I, I called my doctor and she found me someone right away. And that was a blessing. Cause I still, I'm still seeing her and, you know, I, 
I'm okay with talking about stuff like this because I think it's important because again, mental health is extremely important and it affects <laughs> all of us. Yeah. And it's nothing, especially women, men of color, it's yeah. important to to discuss it and not pretend like we don't mm. have stuff going on. So yeah. So yeah, I'm in a better space today. Um, and I'm a much happier person. And um, yeah, but has this path been easy? No, not at all. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I appreciate you sharing that um, because it is, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of, a lot of us lost our love loved loved ones and mm. and um and I started this during the pandemic you know my dad passed away you know in a hospital and caught mm. covid in a hospital you know so you know that it's it's um he was 77 he was fine going in caught covid doesn't come out and so you know there's but but having the space to be able to share how challenges can challenging it can be is really to help others to think actually I'm not alone and um, mm. so that's why I was really appreciate everything you were saying is really important and powerful because a lot of people think they're alone and think it's just them and uh, don't realize that there is help out there and um, it doesn't matter if somebody says oh don't you know you've got you know, what would your your family going to miss you and stuff but when you're in that place doesn't matter what people say. If you want to go, you want to go, and um, it, it it takes skill to be able to listen and then try and walk you through it, as opposed to trying to tell you all the things you're going to miss. Um, yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely. I can tell that I've come a long way because even though my eyes tear up when I talk about it, because it's. It's it is sad to ever get to a point where where you feel like that. Um, but the fact that I can talk about it and I don't completely fall apart anymore <laughs> means I feel like I've made progress. Mm -hmm. that, um, that it wouldn't have been the right thing to do, and you know that I, you know, my story isn't finished yet. I still have a lot to do while I'm here. And plus it's not, you know, it's not our choice or our, you know, to, to make those types of decisions for ourselves. And my mother and father would have been highly upset at me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. They would not be happy. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, especially if you, you've just made Dean's, uh, the Dean's List in the fall. They're like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, and how many other lives are you going to you gonna help save when you qualify and, and, and start working as well? So there's still so yeah. much more. There's yeah, still so much more. Um, what, what, what got you back into singing? Because I think most of us... Um, you know, started to see, um, well, it is Shanna, L, and Sinise, and then they all said, "Oh, look who we just bumped into!" I mean, how did that whole reunion <laughs> thing just so? It just it just felt like one day we um, Shanna and Sinise are posting pictures with you, and the next, you know, you're, you're performing with DJ uh, with Dad, um, not DJ Clue, um, DJ and, and D, uh, D Nice. So, how did At the how, yeah, so how did the whole coming out of the woodworks this happen? Um, that to me, it still blows my mind when I think about how that all happened because I literally had no intentions. It's like you always, you know, even before my dad passed, my you know my mom passing, or just other people in my life who know me, mm -hmm. who would always go you're you're not giving up singing like you you are gonna sing again right and i would go you know what the one thing about music is that you don't you know once a singer you're always a singer mm -hmm. so when people say you know you don't sing anymore it's like 
maybe not professionally, I'm not recording an album, but I'm still a singer. It's just who I am. Mm -hmm. um, so I hate when people would say stuff like that. Cause I'm like, that's not the way to say it. I am a singer, but I don't feel like explaining this to you. <laughs> so um, when I made that decision to go back to school, which was probably around spring where I started kind of looking into these programs and I just said, Oh, I'm going to, I'm just going to do it. And once I started getting everything organized and I remember um it might have been a rollback a few months before that, like around the holiday, around Christmas of, oh, what year is this? 24, 22? Yeah, 2022. Okay. Yeah, around 22. So it was a year after my mom had passed. And I was like on Instagram and I was just, I would always do that. Just see what other people are doing. Or look at people's <laughs> pages, like a low key stalker. Low key stalker like this. <laughs> Yes, I had like this bogus Finster page and or Finstagram, whatever you want to call it, like a fake Instagram. And it was my face, but you couldn't really tell. And I'm like holding a cat and it was like my oldest niece, her cat. And I was following like really no, maybe a couple people. I want to say I'm following like Kamala Harris and maybe Jared Leto, the weirdest <laughs> combination of people to follow <laughs> and um I was I was stalking people and then I started thinking god you know it would really be nice to like reconnect with Shawnee so, who I knew had been looking for me wow. because other people had told me they had either seen on Twitter at the time um when it was still called Twitter <laughs> um that she was posting pictures of her and I wow. and asking people like, if you've seen this missing <laughs> girl, please let me know. And I was like, what? And then I remember searching and finding some of these posts. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, well, how do I do this? Cause I was like, I don't want to create a Twitter page. I, I was on Facebook at one point, I got off of Facebook and I was kind of taking a break from social media. Mm -hmm. So the fake Instagram was literally just to stalk people. And then I started thinking about Shauna because she was part of South Paw management and they were like my last man team for the uh, it's all about you project. And so found her right away on Instagram, found her page and I inbox like DM'd her. I'm like, Hey girl, it's me, Tracy. She's like, no, it's not. <laughs> And then I had to think, oh, wait a minute. We're in the era of people pretending to be yeah. other people, find <laughs> AI, like, girl, you could totally forget technology is not the same. So I'm trying to convince her it's me. And then she's like, you know, take, you know, I said, I'll take a picture of myself in real time. And then I was thinking, well, that could be AI too. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> None of this is working. And then I was still in this headspace where I really wasn't had a, or was really ready to call people either. Mm -hmm. I was kind of just in my little bubble. Mm -hmm. And then we just kept kind of communicating. And then there was something, I think she asked me like, say something that only you and I would know. And then I said, made a, you know, had to think it through. And then I said something and she was like, oh my God, it, I think this is really her. So then she runs into Shanice at Shantae Moore's birthday party and goes, guess who I found? <laughs> and she's like, I found Tracy Spencer. And she's, you know, hit me on Instagram and Shanice is like, no way. And uh, how did it happen from there? Um, oh, Shanice then starts leaving me messages and then I, and I'm like, I'm going to call you like this weekend or whatever. I, and I kept putting off calling her. It was weird. I think unless you've been through what I've been through or yeah. something similar, it's, it's kind of hard for people to understand and, mm. and without them reacting, going, I don't understand. Why you just call people? Why didn't you do that? And it's mm. like, you don't understand the amount of trauma and 
just that I had gone through and going through dealing with mental health stuff that it, it's not that easy, yeah. you know? And, and I felt like, am I ready to start telling people what's been going on? Do I, do I want to keep, re, do I want to relive all of this stuff? And mm. um, so all that went through my head. And then it was, <clears throat> I even went out to California. I didn't contact anybody. And then it wasn't until that following summer that I finally was like, okay, I'm going to call people. Let me see. (laughs) Let Uh me see how this works. And I reached out to Shauna. We, you know, we started talking and then I come out to LA because it was my birthday month is in July. Shauna's birthday is in July. And um she coordinated everything i mean god bless shauna she hooked up meeting up with shawnees and i went to shauna's house got in a car with her we drove out to shawnees and um out to her area um, hooked up with howard hewitt all went to dinner (laughs) and it was like a family reunion wow it was the best day ever and yeah, and then before I left, it was literally not even, it was just supposed to be me, Shauna and um, Shawnees. Mm. And then I get to her place and the next thing I know, Shauna's like, well, guess who called me? And I'm like, who? She's like, Elle called me and he hardly ever calls me. And I told him, guess who's coming to my house? And he said, I'm on my way and I'm bringing a keyboard. <laughs> And she's like, okay. And then Darius calls her and she's like, oh, Tracy and Shanice are over. And he's like, I'm on my way. Like, <laughs> these people had never been in her house. And all of a sudden we had everybody in her house. And um, yeah, Elle showed up. We had a birthday cakes to celebrate me and Shauna's birthday. She had other food brought in and we were just like hanging out. I brought um, my sister's oldest daughter, my niece, Michaela. And yeah, next day I know Elle shows up, hooks up his keyboard and we're all singing together. It was the most surreal and magical experience ever. But I, and that was literally the first time I actually sang in front of other people. And I don't know how long. And you know the world was watching. The and me being oblivious to the you didn't fact realize that, every, that we were all watching. That everyone's gone Instagram live. <laughs> I'm oblivious to what <laughs> happened. Like I had been under a rock. Yeah. And, it was a magical moment watching, you know, I mean you know, for me to interview Elder Barge for almost an hour and a half, you know, magical, but because yeah. I told him how special when he sings, he's it's almost like he's in the presence of God, and he because he just gets lost in song. But you know yeah. him singing and everyone joining in, and then you're 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 there looking like a a puppy with in with, with the headlights on, like okay, what's going on? Do I sing now? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what is happening right now? I felt like I was twelve years old again. <laughs> I really did. It, I just didn't. I couldn't believe what was happening. Wow. It was the wildest thing. And then after that, Sean is like, girl, you need to get a real Instagram page. <laughs> hey, oh, is that when you did the official Tracy? <laughs> okay. I did. And I was scared. Wow. I was petrified because I didn't, I told Sean, I said, nobody cares that I haven't been around. Like, oh, I was like, was no, so one, that was just the way I thought I was like no one's gonna get on my Instagram and be like oh yay you're back they're gonna say oh that was cute and that was fun thanks guys and then move on and she was like I don't think so I she's like I don't think you you understand just the impact you've had on some people's lives and I said I don't I'm not a really aware of that Mm -hmm. and even though I've traveled, I've had, you know, I've done concerts and people have cried and I've had these experiences and you just 
go, I'm normal. Like, why are you crying? Like, this is weird. Don't <laughs> cry. But yeah, so I just didn't, I couldn't wrap my head around that. And so when I did it and then all of a sudden she's like, girl, you see all these people on your Instagram right now. And I'm like, what are they saying? Are they saying they hate me? And I go away. She's like, no, read it. And I was like, I don't want to read. And everybody was so nice and had the most beautiful things to say that I was, my heart was full. I was overwhelmed. And I think I remember crying, reading some of the comments and wow. I just couldn't believe how, um, or what people were saying and that people were actually watching it and in real time and replaying it now. Yeah. And then going, where have you been? What's yeah. going on? <laughs> We're glad you're alive. And you're okay. And you look well. And when are you going on tour now? And I just, I wasn't ready for it. Wow. And then, and then, so yeah, then I started. Um, oh yeah. Then Shanice had mentioned to me, she said, I even was trying to find your brothers. And she said, then I even contact soul. And I asked him like, have you seen have you talked to Tracy? And he's like, if you find her, let me know because wow. nobody can find her. Wow. And so when she told me that, um, because we had such a, a good relationship that I was like, oh, let me like um, reach out to him. I think I like liked something on his <laughs> on his page. And he was like, she did not just like something <laughs> and not say anything. And then he left me a message and then... Um, yeah. And, and his phone number. And then we started talking and, and he, yeah, his reaction was the same thing. He's like, if anyone needs to know how to get off the grid yeah. like disappear, <laughs> they should call you. You should <laughs> write a book about how to remove yourself from, from, from the planet because he's like, nobody does it better. And I was wow. like, yeah, I do know how to disappear if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, as I said, you know, you went through quite a lot, and and it was good that you had your time to to rediscover yourself. Um, and you can't do that in a public space; it, it's, yeah. it's impossible. And you know, people don't aren't ready for you know an hour, two hours of listening. They just want the quick stuff. And like, oh, I was, you know, I was recording suit, uh, you know, undercover albums and stuff. And you know, they want, they think <laughs> that. Um, but but then how did the whole yeah. Kennedy Center de nice? I mean that's that's a, that's taking a you know you're just coming back out of hiding and you're now performing with de nice who you know well yeah that was wild too then um I don't remember I just I think he realized we every you know in this industry you all always have mutual friends yeah and I think someone who's might have been I can't remember who it was. But I think shared that with him that I was on Instagram and <laughs> then he reached out or they connected us together on Instagram. And he was like, hey, I'm doing this thing for the Kennedy Center and I'd love for you to be a part of it. And I was like in my head going, um, that's amazing, <laughs> but I haven't been on a stage wow. in well over 10 years that I was like. I don't know if I can do that. Like in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't sure. I was like, what does that look like? How do I do this? And then um I was like, what is where where's there to be what is you know to be afraid of? I was like, I'm gonna do this. Like, this is what I do. Like, get it together, girl, get it together. <laughs> so yeah, I was like, yes, I'll do it. And then from that was a very tough experience though too because i remember having a moment of um the day of the performance mm. i went out there and or you know flew to dc and i my sister was going to come and then it was she wasn't able to and <clears throat> so i went there by myself and wow. i knew shanice was going to be there so i was like okay at least she's going to be here i mean she's family um, but I remember the next morning before sound checks, I woke up and it was raining and I was laying in my bed and I had my computer cause I had a homework to turn in. <laughs> and, 
I woke up and I just said, I can't do this. And I couldn't get out of bed. Uh -huh. I was stuck mm. and I freaked out yeah. and I start calling people <laughs> because now I do things the right way. Um, I call people and I, I think, yeah, even one of the people I called was so shy. I even called and I needed people to talk me off the ledge, like, and tell me it's okay. You can do this. Yeah. That's what everyone said. They were like, you know, I said, I just don't know if I'm ready to do this. And, you know, everybody's like, your you know, mom and dad are there with you. It's going to be fine. You can do this. And I got it together. And when I saw Shanice, though, it was like a weight had lifted mm. off of my shoulders um, when I saw her um, and her daughter, Imani, like off to the side of the stage. And she's like videotaping me during the sound. <laughs> and then I felt better. And um, yeah, and then I got through it and I was excited. And then after that one performance, I was like, yes, I am. I'm ready to do this again. Put me on a tour, y'all. <laughs> I'm like, where's my next show? <laughs> I was ready. And then we got the um, offer to do um, Sherry Shepard's show. Oh, yeah. So I mean that's that's yeah. nice to not, yeah, but you you're so that, doing you're here. No, that was exciting. So for me and Shanice to do that together too. So then we went to New York. Was it might have been a month after um, the Kennedy Center, and we wow. did that. Together. So yeah, it was the end of the year. Like last year, just became. It was full of surprises, me reconnecting with people, me having an Instagram, which I was just like, there's <laughs> no way. And to doing Kennedy Center, doing a show, reconnecting with people. And then, yeah, it's just. And, you, it's and this great. next week, Valentine's, you with Christopher Williams and Elder Barge? Um, that is. Elder Barge, yeah, in Baton Rouge, it's Elder Barge, um, Glenn Jones, um, Alexander O'Neill. Christopher Williams is uh, March 30th okay. with Sean and Tony Terry and Karen White. I've interviewed all of them. I mean, crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Karen is my favorite. I'm not you know. Yeah, Karen, I love Karen. I love her. Yeah. yeah, I love Karen. She's so much energy. Um, Tony Terry was the one who was telling me about the industry and how tough it was. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, and then L, as I said, but it, it, you had a show that was canceled due to the weather just recently as well. That was the one that got changed to March 30th. Okay, they really, okay, okay. Yeah. So, how are you balancing school and and tour and the shows is it, it do you have to look at your diary and think okay we're an assignment so i can't perform <laughs> oh. i i do do that i <laughs> i tell people if you need me to to be somewhere on a monday tuesday or wednesday i can't do it anything <laughs> after that, i'm available unless i have an exam coming up wow so it's it's hard because i wear it's, you know, I wear a few different hats right now. Yeah. It's like, you know, the purse, the girl I am when I'm at home with my cat and, <laughs> <laughs> and going to school, they're all different people. Yeah. They're all different people. The girl that's um, on stage is a different person. Um, yeah. In class, in class, um, m my classmates don't even know who I am okay. I mean granted at some point they're gonna the the jig is gonna be up because <laughs> someone's gonna find something yeah. but I even go by a different name at school what <laughs> it's I'm telling you I have so I I have multiple personalities <laughs> probably not good for my mental health but <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, well, you, but, you, 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 you're an entertainer. Normally, entertainers have stage names, and then they, you know, not many entertainers had 
their first and last name as their full or their real government name, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So I just wear all these different, yeah, I'm all these different people. And um in the be in at first it was it was hard to to really balance. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And I was saying it all the time. I was even saying it after the holiday. I was just like, I don't know how I'm doing any of this. And you know, I think if I, you know, don't overthink it too much, it's it's fine. Like, yeah, figure it out. How is it like getting the response? The, the response to people you're on stage and singing after you know goes to twenty years, people are still connected to the song. Did, did, that, how does that feel as a just you know after all we've gone from you're singing and people are connecting to it and singing along with you? What does that feel like? It feels like um, I was always it, like I'm doing what I was supposed to be doing. I was born to do what, you know, to, to be a performer, to be a singer. Um, because if it, if I, if, if I wasn't supposed to have, made those choices, get on, you know, be lucky or I don't like using the word lucky because I don't think, I don't really believe in luck, but be blessed enough to, to be on star search, to mm -hmm. make the out I made, to meet the people I've met, to, you know, interact with so many really cool people and um, to create these songs. Like I didn't know that I that I would write a song like Tinder Kisses as a teenager and for it to still be a song that people still, you know, resonates with people or they still love and they still say, girl, you know, your music is on my playlist still. <laughs> yeah. And then now I have a whole new generation who have discovered me um, because of Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Who were like, oh my God, I didn't know who you were. Like, <laughs> You know, I thought you were a new singer. Like, I don't know. <laughs> You're like, listen to my music. And it's, no, it's it's amazing. It is such a blessing. I'm truly grateful. I, I do not take any of it for granted. I think it's amazing. I mean, the golden question is always, would you ever come out with anything new? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So that's that's definitely something Um, I will be a, uh, working on it's I think I gotta finish school first. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's put that away and then I can focus on that. Cause we're also trying to um work out a tour and a couple of other projects too. Wow. So I think it's on it's inevitable that, you know, there will be music. Yeah. Um, hopefully in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually appreciate the fact that uh, Karsten Soshok uh, reached out to you because he was probably one of my favorite guests I've ever. He's the most amused when he tells his story, um, not trying to be funny, but he was the most hilarious and, and in depth. And so when I said, Oh, I went, and yeah, how was it like working with Tracy? He says, Oh, Tracy, let me get it, get up. I'll get it to you. I was like, Wow, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he called me right after and he was like, you have to do this show. And like, I was just like, okay, okay. He said, no, 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 but it'll be one of the best interviews of your life. And yeah, he said he had so much fun talking to you. And I was like, yes, I was like, I just got to figure out when I can do, you know, some things because yeah, I try to not overwhelm myself and try to spread things out right now or strategically do certain things so that I don't get overwhelmed or burn myself out. Like I'm yeah. not going to do that, but yeah, no, he, yeah, he was telling me right away. He like sent me your Instagram and all and I was like, okay. And I was like, wait, I do remember him. I was like, he did hit me before. And then Sean, I remember Shauna talking about you. He's okay. like, you have to do it. You just have to do it. And it's like, okay, that's how, you know how he is. Okay. Very <laughs> so excited. I uh, hope it hasn't been too bad today. No, it was great. It was absolutely great. I enjoyed it. It was great. I always ask all my guests as I end that if you were stuck in a lift and you had to watch your favorite film, what, what's your favorite film? 
Oh my God. Um, well, well, well. This is tough because I have a very eclectic, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like all types of movies, but ooh, that's a tough one. It's going to be somewhere between, and this is going to sound so weird, <laughs> and I know it's going to, it's either going to have to be a James Bond film uh preferably with Roger Moore oh yeah I love Roger Moore love me some Roger Moore <laughs> or it's gonna be Boogie Nights oh goodness Mark Wilberg okay that's a wonderful one to last classic movie or here's just my third option staying alive John Travolta okay <laughs> I just watched it four days ago. It is literally something I watch maybe twice a year. So would that be your all-time favorite movie or which would be your all-time favorite? Staying Alive. No. That and Flashdance are probably my all-time favorite movies. <laughs> okay. Because watching Flashdance, um, I felt like I saw myself in her. Mm watching her um yeah it, I, and I find it to be even though when you watch it now you go oh, it was kind of it was kind of creepy because you know the hey. the guy that she fell in love with was way too old and she was like 18 I was like oh it's kind of parallel to my life because there are lots of old <laughs> creepy men <laughs> <laughs> not that I fall with but it's that same very similar yeah. Um, so yeah, but her just trying to prove to people that she was, you know, she could, you know, she was the best, or yeah. she could compete with the best, you know. Yeah. And she came from literally having no training, and mm. it's not like I went to Juilliard or performing arts schools. I came from a small town in Iowa, and I went to a Catholic school. My parents didn't have that much money. And they worked really, really hard. And um, I end up getting a record deal with a major label and have seen, you know, travel the world and seen things that most people may never see or get to experience. Yeah. So yes. maybe that's why I like staying alive and I like flash dance. <laughs> well, you just got signed to the label yeah. that had the Beatles, Elvis. So, so that's not that's no small feat. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. So I know you mentioned earlier that Diana Ross was your favorite singer, but who? What's your favorite song? Because the other second part of the question is always, well, they're about to put on a movie, but we're going to play your favorite song before the movie starts. And what would becomes your all time favorite song? Aye, aye, aye. Oh boy, the pressure. <laughs> But everyone had a favorite song. Huh? I thought everyone had a you favorite song. I do, but you know what happens is it's not something you sit and think about like all the time. You just go, oh, I love that song or I love that or whatever, yeah. whatever. But I would, I would have to say, um, Probably Casanova Brown by Tina Tina Marie. Wow. It was by far one of my favorite songs because when I was little, it was also a challenging song for me to sing. And I would sing it and sing it and sing it until I could sing it wow. like her. And that's why people like her and Dinah Ross and even, you know, Whitney Houston, um, I think kind of helped shape who I am as a vocalist hmm. because there's elements or just even as a performer, because there's elements of them that, you know, just uh, they carried themselves with so much grace and um, they were just beautiful women. And I'm not just, not just physically beautiful, yeah. but just inside like their spirit and when they performed or just their personalities. And I always wanted to be, you know, as 
as a little girl just growing up. And my mom was very much like that. My mom was very, had this old school, very kind of, I don't know, Hollywood vibe to her too. Like her hair always had to be perfect. My mom never really wore makeup, mm. but she always looked like she had makeup on. <laughs> she had really pretty skin tone and um, she was super petite and um, always just, I remember she used to wear gloves. Wow. Yeah, she had this whole vibe like, um, when she was, you know, younger and when she had her, you know, had my brother, my oldest brother, like she always had this vibe, she used to wear pin curls and she had a whole vibe. <laughs> and then after four kids, you're just like, I ain't got time. To that that. <laughs> but seeing her like that and then seeing the, those type of women, I just like, oh, I just want to, I have so much respect for them. And so just all that, it's, they were like, they were just like the epitome of what beauty and power and being a, a real woman was like to me. And so, yeah, Casanova Brown, um, uh, Billie Holiday's Good Morning Heartache are still songs that I will play more in the summertime. Like if I'm sitting out outside sunbathing, having a cocktail, <laughs> you'll hear Tina Marie very loud in this house. <laughs> the diner, or you're going to hear Billie Holiday and people are like, what <laughs> old man lives in that house? <laughs> It's like it's just me walking around in a sarong and a bathing suit with a cocktail thinking I've transported to the 1940s. I don't know. <laughs> you, you Tell me about Tina Marie because I, I, one would think that as a white woman singing R&B that there would be a sense of, hey, well, why is she taking on, singing on music? But then there's, a, but when I've talked to a, a lot of female artists who admire Tina Marie, they, they see the fantasy of of, her, of what she did and don't even think and remember that she's white. They just know that she was just an amazing soul singer. Is that, do you look, did you just bypass the fact that she was white um, and just saw the talent? Absolutely, because that's just not something that was a a focal point and just even growing up in my family. And I think it's because of us being a mixed race family. I don't know. It was just color was not something we focused on or really talked about. Mm -hmm. And so if I heard music or saw someone, uh, actor or, or singer, the last thing I thought about was the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like, when when you would listen to her, I didn't feel like she was trying to be someone that she wasn't. It felt very authentic. And I think by the time I met her. I um, met her, wow. I finally um, met her in, oh, this was before my, before I was 20, maybe I was around 20. And she was doing a concert in London. And I remember being in London and, um, she invited me to her concert and she was the nicest human in the world. Wow. She um, had all these wonderful things to say to me about me. And I'm just sitting there going, girl, you understand you are one of the reasons why I do what I do. Like I literally wore your records out and um, yeah. And she was like calling me her little sister and wow in all of her but yeah when you meet her then you you do realize that that's just who she is this this is there's nothing her um it's not manufactured that wow. tina marie is tina marie is you know and i felt like that when i met you know diana ross too for the first oh, you time met her. i met her and almost passed out but <laughs> I don't even think I really said anything and I will regret that for the rest of my life, but I do hope that I'll get to see her again. But yeah, I think when I met her and it was in New York at a party for her and I don't even know, I was just like, I, I really want to say, I think I looked at her and said, I want to be you or something so weird. <laughs> she was probably like, get this girl away from me. <laughs> Get this child away from me. But yeah, because you're meeting people who 
mean so much to you and literally help you find your voice. Like they helped me figure out who I was as a vocalist. And yeah, Whitney Houston too. By the time I met Whitney Houston, I almost passed out on that too. And <laughs> did they know who, yeah. did they remember you from, from being, did they know who you were, Whitney? Yes. Whitney I met uh, for the first time was at the Billboard Awards and she invited me into um, when she was getting her hair done so we could just talk. So I was like sitting there and she's getting her hair curled and we're just having a random conversation. And I'm literally like ready to, you know, poop my pants basically <laughs> because I'm just like, bro, I'm sitting here talking to Whitney Houston and she's talking to me like this is normal. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like none of this is normal right now. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Yeah, when Soshuck was saying that when he met Whitney and she said, I like the song, and he just put his head down like, oh, my goodness, this is Whitney Houston. And he, you know, he felt like a kid. Yeah. He, he, so it, it was, <laughs> yes. Oh, it, it's wild. It's wild. But, yeah, she, you know, all of them are very, they're normal people. They're mm. just, you know, it's not like they were trying to be someone else. They were just they were very often being their authentic selves when I met them. And, but I don't think there's anybody else in the world that I would ever react that way to at, at this point. I mean, unless Marilyn Monroe was still alive. <laughs> oh, yeah. You so. did mention Marilyn Monroe or Billie Holiday. <laughs> or yeah, Billie Holiday came over. Yeah. But, but had you met Elle before, before the night at Chandler's party? You know what's funny? We were trying to figure that out. And then I realized, no, I had met Chico a couple, oh. yeah, a couple of times because I remember we even did shows together and I oh. found a picture of me and Chico DeVarge together. And I think we're wearing our hair the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Very, we look like brother and sister because I think we both had our hair slicked back in ponytails and oh. I had like some little curly things. <laughs> he had the same look and I'm just alike in this picture this is so weird so no that night we were trying to think about it and I was like you know even Elle was like I don't think we've ever met before and I'm like I think we've probably been in the same spaces but yeah. never like um interacted or anything so no but seeing him was you know it had I felt like I had known him all my life because yeah. he's just personality too or, yeah you know, and then you're singing it I mean as a fact the fact that he's you know he, he seems to wear his heart on his sleeves when he sings in any situation so just watching you guys all all, all sing in, in in that in that magic moment and stuff yes yeah <laughs> yeah that was an amazing experience well I mean we, we can't wait to see more amazing experiences of you on stage um I've uh, I've really really been blessed by your time. Um, it's been you know it's been it's been a blessing hearing your story and your journey. Um, and and one thing I, I don't focus too much on the music though it's mainly the life journey is really the most important part because as I said everything and my hope is that somebody listens and draws inspiration and, and draws encouragement and. Um, and that's 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 the biggest thing that I that I get, and I so I was really pr appreciated how open and 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 uh, present that you were today. So thank you very much for your time and everything. Oh no problem. Glad that we got to do this, and yeah, no, this was good. It was it was really nice finally meeting you and and talking to you. This was fun. Yes, thank you very much. And you know, I yeah, you mean it's gonna just been three and a half hours, and I'm sure you probably didn't expect to be <laughs> sitting down Are for that long. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, I did not. I know when you talked to Soul that he said I think it was you guys talked for almost three hours or something too. So his was and three, and, three and a half like, hours. Yeah, it was three and a half hours. I was like, we're not gonna talk that long. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Um, oh my god, yeah, because I'm sitting here and I'm looking and it's dark outside now. So um when yeah. we start there was sunlight. There was, there was sunlight, <laughs> safety gap window. And it's not that I because I'm not hounding questions. 
it's just like this let you talk and I'm listening and 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 it's I know I, I don't really prepare lots I part I, I have the only benchmarks I have are the albums when you release them and talk around that but it's it's just really listening about your life and and so yeah I, I, you know so that's hopefully it's always a space um the day we I interviewed him it was the day of Maxie's birthday and I think his father the anniversary when his father passed and he didn't realize until the end that that was all happening on that day um but it was just me listening to him telling yeah. his story telling his story and stuff um but definitely I've re yeah definitely can't say uh, oh I just noticed the guitar do you play oh what was is it a prop or I do no it's a real <laughs> good I do I do play I'm going to play but yes, it is a real guitar and it's, let me tell you, I started writing and playing again around the time my mom got sick because I used to play okay. and then stopped for a while. And then, yeah, when my mom got sick, I went and bought me a, another guitar and I said, oh, I'm going to start writing and playing. And yeah, I was doing that for a little bit and then I go through these spurts or these moments where you know I'm trying to get myself back there again and um uh now with school it makes that much harder because trying to find time between studying and then do that because even right now I, I'm always like oh I gotta put time aside to go to the gym do vocal exercises you know, rehearse my, my, my songs for my shows when they're coming up. And then, um, and my classes are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they're like four hours long. And then I always have tons of homework and tons of reading. So literally trying to even find a minute to just do that. I try to do that on a Sunday because Sundays are literally, I try to make that a day where I you know, I watch church online. I meditate a little. I um, try to make time for myself. Yeah. And I even try not to get on social media that much. Sometimes I may post like one thing, but for the most part, I try to avoid um, be like social media. And the, the, I'm trying to find a balance for myself. Yeah. Like I do, you know, create a healthy balance as I get back into doing this, you know, music again or whatever, just, I don't want myself to get overwhelmed or feel like I don't have time to do these things because I have a show to do and I got this <laughs> to do. I need to go into a studio. I don't want to live like that. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to um, enjoy life mm -hmm. and make music, go to school and just, maintain my peace you know yeah, yeah. And you can That's get but it'd be great to, if you know you just recorded you get your camera and recorded uh, you play can you play tender kisses and uh, with your guitar i probably could and i haven't but you know what i'm gonna work on that i will work on that yeah challenge accept it. <laughs> yeah i mean because that's and then that, I, will, that... I will put it on my instagram yeah, um, you'd be surprised. I mean, that's, I mean, because you, you do want to mix it up in the show, you know, you just bring out the guitar, and like, oh, well, Tracy comes out and you just play it and, you know, just that, an acoustic that, version. That is something I've always wanted to do. I do have, that is definitely something I've thought about where I was like, I would love to be able to do an acoustic set in my, in, in my show at some point. Yeah. So imagine yeah. would be, would be good. Would yeah. Be yeah I mean, but yeah cool. yeah so you know tracy spends her life you know playing with her guitar you know do, do, you mentioned tracy chapman you know you could yeah that would, that would be interesting to say you do it so the, hence that's the motivation yeah. to put in the practice to play to play your own stuff and then you can yeah. say this is a song i wrote a couple of years ago you probably haven't heard it but hopefully you like it and just playing one of the songs you were writing when when you were with your mom and all of a sudden it just becomes really natural and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That's the goal. <laughs> you, get, you definitely get there. 
Well, I've I've kept it. I mean, it is it is quarter to one in the morning. Um, luckily, I'm on leave tomorrow. So, well, in the morning, yeah. So it's a bit, it's quarter to one at a.m. here in the UK. But um, it <laughs> it's been great to really to finally talk to you and and to hear your story. Um, and yes, I will be following with interest and stuff, and 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 I'll be you know keeping in touch and and you know uh, yeah, we're wishing you and supporting you as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Tracy, thank you very much. Uh, we've covered everything that I think we can. Um, everyone should look out on your pages for shows, upcoming shows. Um, mm -hmm. Baton Rouge with Elder Barge. Um, and then a rearranged stuff in March with Christopher Williams and hopefully some other tour dates as our shows come out as well. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. Hopefully I'll have a busy uh, summer. Yes, busy that's summer. Cool. And yeah. if anyone has a heart attack in the audience, you pretty much can come out there really <laughs> resuscitate it. I, I can get the defibrillator and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll be yeah, I'll, yeah. Do, I'll do everything in my power to save your life. <laughs> well, they said that I should call my tour "Saving Saving One Life at a Time" tour or something. <laughs> yeah, and I was yeah. like, girl, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got a song that says "Save Your." It's, you know, it's, it's called "Save Your Love." But hey, I can save your love. Could I can save your life? You know, can save your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh goodness! Oh, well, I appreciate it, Tracy. And, Yes, I, yeah, but I'll yeah, definitely be keeping in touch and following and, and I appreciate your time and everything. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll let you go. It's yeah, we've we've yeah, we've got three hours and twenty minutes. So it's it's um it's yeah, it's, yeah. Ten minutes shorter than constant, but it's it's a lot. <laughs> so you can, <laughs> I do wonder I would and, and I don't know what it's like when you're sitting down there. Whether you felt the fact that you've been sitting down for over three and a half hours, does, does it you don't even recognize? No, I'm glad I I didn't even think about it today because then I would have had more anxiety just thinking about it. So no, this is good that I had no clue that we would be talking for almost three and a half hours. Yeah, I never planned to talk for three and a half hours. I I don't I you know I'm thinking here okay it's you know it's, it, I start at nine thirty I should maybe it should be forty minutes and stuff. But when you when people when a guest talks, I'm there listening. I don't stop and say, "Oh, okay, we've reached that time." So, uh, yeah. So yeah. it's never. Uh, yes, I said it, I don't come with a a timer and stuff. I think my longest interview was with Tammy Lucas, and it was four hours. Um, wow. But it was just listening, and 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 that's that's pretty much what it is. It's it's not. Um, uh, and uh, but I'm as a therapist, you're trained you're trained to listen, and I enjoy listening. Um, and it becomes yeah. easy not to be non-judgmental to be able to draw out the um, draw, just draw out the conversation because um, mm -hmm. I'm not asked for sensation like okay what well, what happened there and you know, it's about life and so yeah no absolutely <laughs> yeah love it yes okay well I, yes I I could keep you on forever but I will let you go and <laughs> keep in touch. <laughs> Yeah, I think I need to find food now. So yeah. I'm go. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tracy. Take right. care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of Halftime Chat. Please remember to subscribe, to share, and comment. But most importantly, why don't you become a member of Halftime Chat? We've got amazing videos, amazing perks, and um, being able to support the channel. But anyway, thanks for watching. Take care. I never participated in that kind of hey, the summer in between us or even loving us on which I did miss you with the problem is sure with girls are like growing up it is if she still making an impact on four houses down and I'm not I have a crew and then get this one and that one but that works for me but this for me I can do I mean, I was, I, I love, I love all different jobs.